Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And today uh, I've been requested to talk about Ireland's vanishing triangle. That thing looks like a triangle, right? Six women disappeared, never been found. Cases are still open. And this is from the 90s. Um, and I started looking into this and it gets a little more complicated than people imagine. So I'm going to get into how the women disappeared. Are these the only women that disappeared? Is it unusual that they disappeared in this time period? Did the police do a bad job? Did they do, do a good job? All of that. I'll explain where I got my information from, what information I like and what information I don't. And uh, just to start you off, before I welcome everybody who's in the chat room, uh, six women <laughs> went missing over a period of five years. Never been found. Okay, I could just stop right there. Uh, and I could then go back and tell the sad story of each person disappearing. Um, and there's other places to do that. But as this is an educational channel, I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey. Um, a little haphazard one. Because... It's, there's so much information and from so many places, it's, it's not so easy. So what I want to do is help you understand if you were an investigator on these cases, uh, what would you do? <laughs> How would you deal with all of this? And what, 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 <laughs> what roads would you run down? You know, uh, and what would you do when you got nowhere? Um, and so, I'm going to kind of give you the feel of what it would be like to be an investigator uh, during this time. And I think maybe you'll have a little more sympathy for investigators after you start going, oh, my head hurts, <laughs> because that's probably the way they felt. So anyway, I do want to welcome everybody who is here in the chat room. Uh, I didn't get to say hello before. Uh, I used to try to say hello before the show starts, um, but there was a strange noise uh, next to my kitchen. I thought it was a raccoon, but it turns out to be my daughter's cat and I let it in and had to make, had to defrost food for it. And um, it had some food and left. <laughs> it's never done that before, but I guess I was hungry. I don't know. But anyway, hello, Mary. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Lisa. Uh, hello, Harpa, Kurtz, Clarissa. Who else is in here? Anne Maria's here. Lex is here. Um, who else is in here? Uh, Melanie is here. Harpa's here. Did I already say that? Now I start repeating myself. Sky Ricky's here. Um, uh, let's see. Who have I? I Aisha's here, um, CJ's here, Allison's here, uh, let's see if I missed anybody so far, um, probably, if I miss you, um, Bogey is here, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, because um, <laughs> I don't know if we were using real names or interesting made-up names, I never know, but anyway, if I didn't say your name, welcome to the chat room. And if you're about to arrive, welcome to the chat room. And if you'd like to be in the chat room, um, let me just do my little spiel as I start the show. Um, that's uh, people in the chat room are patrons of Patreon. Click the link below in the description. It's five bucks a month. You can join to come to eight shows a month, two a week. Uh, I have the case shows on the weekend. I have hangouts during the week and we have a community. It's five bucks a month and it supports this educational channel, which is extremely important. You don't have to join Patreon to see my my videos. Every single one of them are available to the public. But please do subscribe to the channel. Uh, this week was probably the worst subscription week I've ever had. I have no idea what the heck happened. Um, it just like I started checking to make sure that people could even see a subscribe button. Uh, so either people are starting to dislike me, <laughs> but I had actually doubled the views this week than I've had in months. It was like a really busy week, but very low subscription rate. Who knows? Maybe, maybe, I don't know. I can't figure it out. But anyway, if you're not hating on me, click the subscribe button, keep the channel going, uh, click that little bell for notifications. And if you get unsubscribed, which people are complaining about, subscribe again, because I don't control YouTube or the algorithm or anything else. So anyway, that's that. Uh, also, there are books below you can support the channel with, the little dollar sign, yada, yada. And let's go on to this, this show. All right. Now, what's very interesting, let me, let me show you, first of all, where I got my information from, okay? Because um, <laughs> you're going to find there's two main places people are going to get their, their information from. And I want to make sure that you know where the better stuff is. All right. 
what brought this to a lot of people's attention recently is is was a show it's a series called the vanishing triangle um i found it on um uh amazon prime it's a fictionalized version of these six women that go missing although <laughs> let me tell you it's not it's not it's not a it's not a um dr dr dramatic take on each one of the cases it just uses some of the the ideas and then goes off on its own. Um, I spent money on it. I kind of regret that. Um, it was pretty awful. Uh, the beginning has some interesting things. I like the first show because they were using stuff from the, the vanishing triangle cases. And then they went off on the deep end where you start having the, um, uh, the, the serial killer uh, starts chasing the journalist, you know, that kind of crap. Um, as if serial killers chase journalists and police around. They don't do that. Uh, I'm still here. So let me tell you, <laughs> I never got letters from, oh my God, I'm coming after you. No, I never got that. So here she is. Supposedly her mother was killed by a serial killer many years ago. And when she's investigating this newest killing, like I forgot how many years later, we're talking 20 or whatever, 15 years later. She puts an article out and then the serial killer contacts her and says, ha, 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 and sends her a picture of the recent girl. And so now she knows the same serial killer is killing again. Oh, get out of here. And so, so it devolves into just plain stupidity. Um, she ends up chasing the serial killers, and there's more than one, and she ends up chasing them into, like, she, she's in her car and she wants to find the girls that have been kidnapped, because now it's two at one time. And she's, ch she's following the serial killer there down a dark mountain road uh, as if he wouldn't notice the headlights behind him because there's nobody else on the road but the two of them. And then he parks and then she runs through the woods and goes up to his house and she's peering in the windows and then she knocks something over. So of course, ah, he comes after her, but no worries. She was prepared because when she was at a hotel doing some investigating, she picked up a very heavy ashtray on the way out and stole it stuck it in her clothes <laughs> and i'm like first of all i'm thinking what what hotel puts out one huge massive ashtray instead of small ashtrays which you can easily take care of <laughs> anyway she had that ashtray so she brains the guy but apparently it doesn't keep him out forever so he can chase her again um and uh, it's just so stupid and so then um, along with that the the police there's a there's a police detective she kind of buddies up with and she's allowed to come to crime scenes and in crime scenes First of all, police don't want journalists anywhere near the crime scene. This can, first of all, this contaminates the crime scene. And secondly, who allows journalists near that kind of stuff? No, that just doesn't happen. But of course, this is, again, they're butting up and they're both trying to solve the crime. And then at some point, the even the police officer, he goes into, he goes into this dangerous crime scene chasing somebody and he's got no backup. I'm like, it's just making my head hurt. So it's real stupid. Let me put it that way. Would I waste money on it? No. I, I would not. Um, I will show you the the two good, a couple things I liked in the film in a minute. Um, ju just because I started out, I say the first, the first one, the first uh, episode was fine. And then it just, okay. So that's that one. Next, you're going to see um, Six Silent Killings. This is a documentary done by Sky. Um, now, uh, if you're not in, Ireland or, or UK of some sort, England, you're not going to be able to access this unless you have a VPN. I have a VPN. Uh, VPN, in case you don't know what it is, um, you can, it blocks where you're coming from and you can pick whatever country you want to pretend you're coming from. Kind of crooked, I suppose. And um, so I put myself in, 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 uh, in, in London. And so that way they think I'm not from out of the country. Now I, I paid for this show, by the way. Um, I, I had to join the, 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 the um, it's called now N O W and it, it's, you know, another entertainment channel. I had to join and I had to pay. I did get a free week, which I then canceled. But in order to do that, I had to put in my address. And of course I didn't have an address <laughs> anywhere in the UK. So I just went over to Google and I said, uh, England postcode addresses and they popped up with a whole bunch of, I don't know whose addresses those are, but I borrowed one, threw it in there and they accepted it, used my credit card and I was able to see this. It's a two-part um, show, a two-part documentary. What do I think of it? 
I liked a lot of the people in it. I liked I liked the reporter in it. Um, let me show you a couple of the, some of the people. Um, uh, the journalist who was on this like forever, like very much obsessing over it. Um, where is it? Yeah, I think this is this it. Yeah, here we go. Uh, her name is Geraldine Nyland. I liked her. She she she's just really into this whole case. I don't know. She she believes she may have had some impact on starting things up again. I don't know how true that is, but anyway, I liked her. Um, and then you had a couple of these guys. Um, you had a, this. Uh, I think he's a. I can't quite read this because it's small. Retired detective, I believe, and he has some interesting things to say. We have this. Uh, um, this basically on the right side is a guy named Dave. Um, Kenny, David Kenny, he's a forensic analyst. He's like, he's like a profiler. Uh, I thought he was pretty good too. And there's one other guy there and I'm sorry, I don't have his name. I kind of blew it. Can't, couldn't figure out what his name was. Um, but I like the people in it. The show itself is, tells the stories. It has a lot of really annoying, dramatic music and, and the family speaking. And if you just want the heartfelt type of thing, it's good for that. Uh, this is also good if you want to feel sad for families. This is a great show to see because it's very sad. They're showing the victim side of it, which is good. And here they also show the victim side of it. And um, but in the long run, what you have is not not no. You don't find out what happens with the six women that disappeared. They just just disappeared. This book, The Vanishing Triangle, written by Claire McGowan. Um, uh, I saw some good, uh, good reviews of it. And then I saw some really mean reviews of it. Like she's all over the place. Couldn't follow anything. What a piece of, and, um, but I bought it and I really like it. So Claire McGow McGowan, I appreciate your work. She's normally a fiction writer and she decided she was interested in this. She wanted to, to study it some more. And she brings up some things that I don't think either one of these things touched. Um, she gets into a lot of the issues uh, of the culture, of the times, of police issues, her own personal feelings about things, safety issues for women. There's so many things. And, and, and she's very, um, she's just, she's very open about things. And she'll say like, well, I did a little, and then she'll go, but you know, <laughs> maybe. So I really like what she had to say. So I'm going to go through some of her book and the things I picked out. And it may not be in order. As I said, it may be confusing, but it's just like a detective just saying, oh, my God, what do I do with all these cases? I'm, I'm losing my mind. I want to bring up some of the issues she brought up um, and talk about them so you can understand how serial homicides are followed through. Or what, are they even serial homicides? What happens? How do the women actually disappear? So I, I just think this is really an excellent book. So these are I saw both of these and I read this. So those are those are my um the information and I will link below. I can't, I got all I can say is Amazon prime for here. Uh, you got to be able to hook into now here. I will link the um, book vanishing triangle below because I think she deserves people to buy it. And I think you'll find it really interesting. Um, much more than just about the crimes. It's about the, the culture around the crimes. And sometimes I find that really annoying. <laughs> you know, I'm a profiler. I'm like, Oh God, do we have to go into everything else, but she does it well. And I found it fascinating and I found it very educational. So I'm going to get, so that's where I got my stuff. So I'm going to get started now. I'm going to check your comments and then I'm going to go to, what are we looking at? <laughs> okay. Whew. So um, just to see if there's everybody's saying hello. So it's, it, what's free on prime. I paid for this sucker. I had to pay like $12 for that thing. It wasn't free on my prime. <laughs> I don't know what prime you're on. Um, it's not free with just a membership. No, I have, I have Amazon prime, but it, it, Amazon prime used to give you almost everything free. And now they just make you pay for movies and series. And on top of that, that used to be like 99 cents and now it's three 99. It's gotten really expensive. So that sucks. Um, Oh, wait, wait a minute. I got to see what Kurtz has to say. <laughs> the picture looks like the X-Files. <laughs> well, that may be true. Um, I don't know what you stopped watching, but okay, I'm, I'm with you there. Just really, I ended up watching the whole series and, I, and it's just like, did I just waste that much time of my life? But I did. And I'm, I'm really, no, oh, free for you. Huh. Oh, you're special, Sarah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let me get to... 
all of this. All right. Now, where do I want to start? It's, it's really, it's hard to figure out where to start with this. It really truly is. So um, again, if you're not here for education and don't have a lot of patience, you probably just want to shove off now and, and go meet your friends at a bar <laughs> because I'm not telling the stories of six women. I will tell you something about each one of the cases as it applies to how, how would we even look at this stuff? So, all right. When I, when, when we go, I go to this book, which I really like, um, she, um, she talks about this, um, this case right up front. She says, before she gets further on, she says, the crime I'm thinking of took place. Oh, she says this first, the, the woman who was, who was, who was kidnapped. She says, she saw his face and he spoke about his family and his life. And you know what that means when he tells you these things? He didn't bother to hide his face. This is always a very, very bad thing. <laughs> when, 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 a, when a person abducts you and, and gives you lots of information about who he is, you know you're not going to live. Okay? You're not going to live. So there, what she's talking about is this fella here. And let me tell you, let me give you a little bit about the crime. This is not one of the six. Okay, and you're going to say, well, why are you outside of the six already? Because the six weren't, you know, we think because the movie puts out six in this triangle that there are only six crimes. Oh, no, no. There are many before. There are many after. And the whole question is, do these have something to do with the other six? Or are we just picking out six when this has been going on for a long time and still is? And I think this is a valid point to make that, uh, why these six are they being pointed out? Um, so anyway, this fellow, he grabs this woman and it says, she's, she writes this. The crime I'm thinking of took place in February of 2000. Okay, now let's go just, just to stop for a second. Um, when did these other crimes take place, right? Because we're talking about the vanishing triangle. We have six crimes. We have nine, 1993 to 1998, essentially. We have, we have uh, these six women, 1993 to 1998. But this happened in 2000 after, and of course the question is, did this guy have something to do with one of these six women going missing? Yeah, he could have, but let me read this to you because it's, it is, it, it's, it's, it's very good. Uh, on a dark and cold night, that's a stark and dark and stormy night. I think that's how you start fiction stories. It was a dark and stormy night, but anyway, it was a dark and cold night uh, at the center of Carlo, a small town in the Southeast of Ireland. Oh, before I go on, I just want to point out something about Ireland. Okay, first of all, I want to say I'm not Irish, which anybody from Ireland can obviously tell. I've never been to Ireland. Um, my daughter just went there last, uh, about six months ago or whatever. She and her husband and my granddaughter went and had a great time. I've been to the UK, but most mostly London. I lived in Ealing for like a month, um, but I've never been over to Ireland. So please invite. Anyway, um, but I want to point out something about Ireland. And by the way, in the comments below, if I screw all kinds of stuff up about your country and your culture, I'm not going to take offense as long as you're polite. <laughs> Say, well, Pat's not quite like that. Okay. Anyway, I want to show the size of Ireland because I'm in the U.S. That is the size of Ireland compared to the U.S. And it's just when you look at that, you say, oh, for a lot of people, that might make a difference as to how far anybody can travel within the country. And sometimes our people will say, oh, well, Pat, don't you think this guy that committed a crime in this location committed that crime too? And I'm like, no, it's like 2,000 miles away. Unless he's a trucker or something, why would he be there? But Ireland's not that big. It's important to note that. Now, I live in Washington, D.C. area. And I'm looking at this right here. And this is a superimposed uh, map of Ireland there. Now, I've been down to Richmond. It takes me two hours. Scranton, Pennsylvania, I have no reason to go to. Um, I have been to Philly, which is also a couple hours. So c would a serial killer possibly travel two hours that way or two hours that way? Well, heck yeah, absolutely. So it's to keep in mind, it's not that big a country. So when you're looking at the the triangle that they're they're focusing in on, maybe over-focusing in on, uh, on, on the show, it is a small area outside of Dublin, but 
it doesn't mean somebody from here couldn't go here or couldn't go here or couldn't go there. And there is the north south of a uh, thing in Ireland, uh, which uh, which uh, the author of the book I like um, addresses uh, that there's there's a border between north and south, but the border isn't like a big fat wall. It's just a line on a map um, and anybody can cross it. So the point being that serial killers sometimes like to cross lines. They do that so they're, they're, the crimes, they're, they and the crime are in two different jurisdictions. So we have to keep that in mind that just because, oh, well, that's in south or that's in north, so what? And, you know, they, they might purposely cross lines. They do in the United States, they cross into the next county, they cross into the next state in order to screw up investigations because a lot of times people don't, there's not a good way of communication between different um, departments. Um, for example, and, and the, the, the movie that I don't like, I did like this scene. However, this was, um, so the, the journalist is calling to find out if there's a database that she can access to link things together. <laughs> and then they've just, she says, is there, is there a national database? And, and, and the answer on the phone, the person on the other end says, no, it doesn't exist. You have to contact local police stations individually. And she says, how many are there? And, and they tell her 564, which she then mutters, Fuck. anyway, and that's true because I've done investigations where now, for example, I live in Maryland. I can go to the Maryland case search and I can search people's names. It's great. But there's other places. I can't do that. I can't do that in Washington, D.C. So if I have somebody I'm looking at in, in Maryland, I can't go to that, find that out in D.C. I have to drive to a freaking courthouse. And once I was doing an investigation, I had to go to a courthouses in Virginia. And I had to go. I, had, I drove to one courthouse, looked everything up, went to the next courthouse. Look, I went all the way down to Richmond to two, that two hours I just showed you, two hours south. I drove that whole route going to every major courthouse I could find to find information about a particular person. It's not a good thing. So that complicates um, a police investigation that they cannot, that they have so much, they can't access all the different cases especially if time has passed and they, they you know who, who was working that case. They try to call someplace. Oh, I don't know. That was detective so-and-so he retired. Okay. Does anybody even know about that case here? <laughs> you know, it gets to be quite messy. And it's because it's, it's, it, 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 there's um, now better systems, but they're not great even now. So, um, so that's what she writes about. She's talking about a dark and cold night in the center of Carlo, a small town in the Southeast of Ireland. She says, but equally, I could be thinking of a more recent case from 2018, where a young woman getting off a bus, this is 2018, now remember, this is, this is the, we're talking uh, 19, we're talking, say 1990s, but even 2018, which is five years ago, she's talking about a particular case, where a young woman getting off a bus was snatched from the road in broad daylight. It was just after six on a May evening, and she was shoved into a Nissan, uh, Kashki, I don't know how you pronounce that, and driven away. Very similar stories between what happened sometimes here where women just got grabbed and what happened then. Um, now, what happened, <laughs> he got, they got real lucky with this guy. Let me, let me see if I can find the case for you. Um, this is recent, and I, the reason I want to bring up the recent case is so you understand that things have not entirely changed in the, the way... Um, uh, let me see if I can find which one it is. I think it's, is it this one? Oh, crap. Now I'm going <laughs> to, hold on a second. Is it this one? Not, was it that one? No, that's not the one. Okay, hold on a second. I got to find them. Uh, where'd it go? Uh, see, I have problems with those tiny little pictures. I always have problems with. Well, let, let me read about the story and then I'll find, hopefully find the uh, person. Um, hold on a second. As I said, it's an educational channel. You gotta, you gotta have a little bit of patience. Um, uh, it is. Oh, Lord, is it Maryland? There's so many. See, there's, there's a, there's a whole bunch of people. <laughs> That's a problem. That there's, um, that. Hold on, evil. Yeah, not him. 
<laughs> There's so many killers, I can't keep up with them all. This is Phyllis Murphy, and that's not who she's talking about. Let me let me find out the name of the person she's talking about, um, because it's quite complicated. Um, what's her name? Why isn't her name in here? Um, this was the guy. I'll read you the story first. So back in 2000, um, the the uh, the Carlo attack, which happened 18 years prior, the witness saw the second abduction. Okay, hold on a second. I've got now. See, I'm getting confused because again, it's very complicated, and I've got to find the story. So hold on a second. Um, the reason the stories are interesting is because they they have so many similarities, but not they're not necessarily the same the same killer, which is what's so interesting about that. Um, hold on a second. Please have patience. Yeah, well, I, well, I dick around with this stuff. Okay, where did it go? Well, maybe it's this one. All right. Um, not that one. There's so many. I swear to God, I, I, I'm dealing with... Oh, there she is. Okay, I found her. <laughs> Finally found her. My apologies. Okay, this is... Not her. Um, where'd she go? Where'd she go? And she is not her. Where's where's my girl gone? Oh my god, my girl is gone. Hold on a second. Uh did I not bring her over? Okay, you know, it's probably the missing pro missing picture problem. Hold on. Where'd she go? Um There she is. I found her. Hopefully this is this. Okay. <laughs> okay. This girl. All right. Sorry about that. This actually happened in 2018. I want to bring you up to date because when I go back, you're going to see the similarities, which is really creepy. 2000, in 2018, on May 19th, Justine Valdez was on her way home to Enniscary, Wicklow, Ireland. She lived with her parents, Teresita and Danilo Valdez. Uh, her parents had moved to Ireland from Philippines. It was a mission to build a life in Ireland so that just Justine could one day move there to live with them too. And that was what they were doing. She had now just moved and she was studying accountancy. She worked part-time as a care assistant and, and she worked in a restaurant. She was a very, very great daughter, shall we put it that way. She was doing everything right in life. So she was in constant contact with her parents, and that day had been no different. She'd exchanged some 63 messages with Teresita throughout the day. I mean, she and her mom are like, like this. The last contact was 4.20 p.m., and Teresita asked Just, Justine to buy some bread on her way home. Justine went to the gym after her appointment at the police station. While she at the police station, she was renewing her residency permit. Before getting on the bus at 5.40 p.m., she bought bread. And then she got on the 185th at 85 number bus in Bray. It was after 6 p.m. when the bus arrived in Enniskerry Village. Jasmine got off the bus and began to make her way home. The walk home from the bus stop normally took 15 to 20 minutes. That day, just Justine never made it home. Okay, and we're going to see over and over again, one of the biggest problems in all of these cases is women without transportation. Either they had to walk from A to B or the bus stones didn't run or whatever. And so they're either walking or on the street or maybe they took a ride. One of those two things did them in. Um, due to Justine's frequent contact with her mother that day, her mother was instantly worried when she didn't arrive home. She knew her daughter very well. If her plans had changed, she would have told her about it. Well, you know, 63 text messages. I'm pretty sure she would have texted her and say, I'm going to stop at a friend's house. People saw Justine on the bus and getting off the bus. At just five foot tall, the 24-year-old had striking looks. She was slim with long, dark hair and big, beautiful brown eyes. That day, she was wearing her gym clothes, gray leggings, white t-shirt, trainers, and a dark jacket. So where exactly was Justine? And what happened to her after getting off the bus to walk home? Now, this is a case where they essentially got lucky, uh, the police. At 6.24 p.m., just a few minutes after she got off the bus, the police received a call. 
A female motorist was driving her son when she saw a man in a Nissan car bundling a girl into the boot of his car. Now, that might raise your suspicion. Usually you don't put your girlfriend in the boot of the car. So she's like, oh my God, he's actually kidnapping a girl. Um, the girl was Asian with dark hair. The driver saw the car stopped on the road with no lights and no blinkers on, and she drove around the car to overtake it. As she did, she saw the girl looking out at her from the boot of the car and heard shouting and screaming. The driver pulled over and called the police immediately. Well, now we have the fortune of having a thing called a cell phone. Back in the days of the, the vanishing girls in the triangle, there were no cell phones. So that's interesting. That And there were the CCTV suck too. It didn't exist. So you don't have cell phones or CCTV. So when somebody disappeared, they were gone. Well, this woman, thank God she saw this and called. Around 10 minutes later, a male motorist saw a woman in the back of a car banging on the windows. At the time, he thought she was a child, but something didn't feel right about the situation. And that man discussed it with his wife when he got home and they reported it. His report was made at 720. So another guy reports her missing. Police went to the road where the first motorist had seen a man bundling a girl into his car. They found Jasmine smashed phone and a bag with bread inside. So we know she had been abducted. Police believe Justine was in grave danger. Helicopters and patrol cars were dispatched in a bid to find her. By Saturday night, as it became dark, still no sign of Justine. However, the police got a break at 3 a.m. in the morning. They identified the man driving the, the Nissan car as Mark Hennessy. They went to Mark's home because that's where the car was registered. He was a married father. The 40-year-old had two young daughters with his wife, Nicola or Nicola, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it, Nicola, I assume. And he seemed like a typical married family man. He worked as a banksman on building sites. His younger daughter had just been born the previous September. Police spoke with Nicola. She told police she saw Mark on Saturday, Sunday, Saturday afternoon. He went to work at 7.30. He returned home after 3, at 7.30 a.m., returned up 3 p.m., left around 5.25 in the evening, said he was going for a drink, but you hadn't seen him since. <laughs> so they went to the pub. And they confirmed that Mark had been there on Saturday, but he initially stayed just around 10 minutes, watched some football. And then the CCTV showed him leaving the pub at 5.41 p.m. and walking to the car park where his car was parked. He appeared to be on the phone at the time. He left in his car two minutes later. Half an hour after that, he was driving behind the 185 bus that Justine was on. CCTV footage from the bus confirmed this. At 11 p.m. that night, he returned to the pub. He spoke with a couple at the at the door of the pub, who knew his family, and then he left. Where was he for those six hours, you know, in between? And where was Justine? So they had him as a suspect. Um, and he, um, so then the friends and family were searching for him um, and, the, and the car. Uh, and then finally, a woman did see the car, and she notified the police, and they quickly arrived. Police found Mark sitting in the driver's seat of the car. He was covered in blood. The blood was his own. He had cut himself with a Stanley knife. In a standoff with police, police fired at him and a bullet ricocheted off his shoulder and killed him. Oh, what a shame. Just, Justine was not in the car, though. A bloodstained note was found in the car. It was difficult to make out, but police saw the words, sorry, and Puck's Castle. This led police to search the area, and on the 21st of May, they found her body in a dense woodland south of Dublin. She was declared dead at the scene. She had been strangled. Uh, they believe she'd been killed that night. Uh, there was bruising and there was abrasions to the genitals. So they knew she had been raped. Um, and uh, it said no connection was made between Mark and Justine. In other words, they didn't know each other. So this is a stranger sexual homicide. What does this mean? So I'm, gonna, I'm going to go through this with a bunch of these different guys that we're going to talk about. That means, in my opinion, he's a serial killer. Now, he's in his 40s. He chooses to abduct a girl, chuck her in the boot of his car, take her someplace, rape her, and strangle her. It, he put, sorry, I think he knew he was caught. That's why he was saying that. Um, why he decided to say where she was is interesting. But So he's a married guy, two little girls, and he ended the life of this young woman. Um, so they apparently did not know much. People said, well, I guess we didn't know this guy. I <laughs> guess not. Um, he consumed a lot of cocaine in his lifetime. His marriage was ending. He was in debt. So his life was spiraling out of control. He was, had started trying to pick up women in pubs and even joining dating apps. But whatever reasons, he decided to kidnap her. 
Now, most serial killers do, you know, wait, don't wait till 40. We have absolutely no idea if he committed anything prior to age 40. So is it possible he uh, could have been one of those people that attacked the girls in that uh, the vanishing triangle? I don't think they found any connections, but it doesn't mean he couldn't have done it. Had they not shot him, thank God they did, he might have gone on to kill more women. And I've always pointed out serial killer, you know, a guy who, rape, who abducts or attacks a complete stranger and rapes and kills her is not somebody who's unwilling to do it again or hasn't done it already. So when I see that, I call that person a serial killer. I don't need to know there's another case out there. I just don't need to know it. Either we need to look in the back, look backwards and see if he's done it before, or we need to pay attention to what he could do in the future. Um, but it's not something, you, it's it's not a thin line. You know what I mean? It's a thick line. If you're going to cross that, you, you got, that's who you are. That is who you are. So this happened in 2018. And I just want to point out the style of it because in, in back in the, the, uh, the Vanishing Triangle days, some of the, the cases were very similar. A woman getting off a bus and being attacked. And it was a broad, it was, you know, being attacked and thrown in a boot of a car. And so we have other cases that, that are similar to that. And um, let, let me bring up the one that is very similar to that, which is a famous case. Um, and it is the case of um, Larry Murphy. He's brought up in the show. And Larry Murphy, they, they I, I do not have a, a name of the victim because um, because uh, her name is she she survived so therefore uh, they did they know her name is out out there she survived but listen to the story about this and it's it's very very fascinating how similar it is to the one I just explained Murphy he is a suspect in the in the other crimes why he was um, caught and convicted in the brutal attack and rape of a 28 year old woman. Now, what, what year was this? Um, now I just, I just love articles that don't give you the prop. They don't actually have the, don't actually have the name. I mean, you know, come on now. Um, when in February, 2000 was when he got convicted. Okay. Let me put a, let me put his lovely face up. And I say that not meaning it at all. Um, let me put him behind me. Okay. So this is Larry Murphy. Um, he's a suspect in one of these cases, maybe more, more than one of these cases and maybe a very old case. All right. Um, he is a key suspect. Let me show you the women. He is a key suspect in the, uh, the, the Jacob case in 1998. Very good. Sus and there's a good reason to believe he might have killed her possible here but not as not so much not so much here either the other three women these three women were believed to have been actually killed by people they knew um and therefore not necessarily a serial killer um but he definitely was a good good suspect for this but let's look at who he is let's look at the way he committed the crime what happened was he is a married father of two <laughs> so something about being married fathers of two in ireland there's something going on here um, he was from Bolton Glass. He kidnapped his victim and drove her into the mountains where he assaulted and raped her. Now, what happened in the case, he actually put her in the boot of the car. <laughs> so I guess boots of the car are great places to put people. So he chucked her in there and he drives into the mountains where he, and he stops and he rapes her. And then he, go, keep, then he puts her back in and drives further. Uh, and he goes to what's considered a very isolated place. And I'll get into some of the issue about what place he chose. And what happened to him? Well, here, here's what um, here's what the uh, the the FBI decided to do a profile, which I thought was pretty nonsensical because it wasn't based on anything. And they did this profile, but I have to laugh because let me see if I can find it here. Um, oh, that he's a sexual psychopath and possibly a serial killer. Okay, that's fine. Um, let's see. Oh, no, that's not what I'm looking for. Hold on, where am I looking for it? Okay, hold on a second. Where's my? Okay, where'd I put it? Where'd I put it? Where'd I put it? Okay, where'd it go? Hold on a second. 
Uh, I'm I'm stuck with tiny little pictures, and they're so annoying. I swear to God, so annoying. Um, uh, maybe this is it. All right. Um, nope, that's not it. This is it. All right. Uh, the FBI. Now they 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 they're actually doing. They were actually doing the. Um, it was it was actually in the case of this victim. This is Annie McGarrett, and um, she, uh, the, 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 the. I guess the family contacted somebody, and they contacted some FBI guy, and they did a profile um, of her killer, which basically all we know is that she disappeared. Um, so they did a profile based on absolutely nothing, and their profile was this. The profile is, um, hold on a second. I got to be able to see. Oh, sorry. That's not it either. <laughs> I just had it. I lost it again. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. Oh, where'd it go? Tiny little pictures. Okay. Here we go. All right. So the profile was basically this. The FBI puts out a profile for the, for the guards. Okay. The profile was that he's a married man mm -hmm, in his thirties with children and no run-ins with the law. Where they got that from a crime scene, I have no clue. This this is kind of a standard when this is a standard FBI profile. So when you don't have a woman is like just if a woman is hit over the head, like she's running down a bike path and she's hit over the head, a lot of times they'll say, Well, that was a disorganized killer, and therefore he's like some loser dude, uh, maybe 20s, um, doesn't you know, has problems with women, can't keep a job, and um probably probably not married maybe lives with his mommy um because it's a it's a very simple crime but when you get somebody who's abducted and taken away and you can't find the body they roll out the he's in his 30s married has two children and very very clever you know <laughs> so and the the and is that sometimes true yes sometimes it is true when you get somebody who puts more effort and time in uh you tend to somebody who has a little bit more experience perhaps a little more mature um, yeah, they could be, but then again, not always, you know, so you want to be very careful when you're putting out profiles based on not the evidence, but just some statistical stuff or something out of your head. Um, and the, the claim here is that, that you normally, these guys don't get caught except for some, they say screw up in some way or just get really bad luck. And I'll tell you, that's true for all serial killers, not just, not just these, just the smart ones. What happens with most serial killers is this. The first killing, they don't know what the hell they're doing. So they might chase, you know, they might try to abduct a woman that goes badly and she punches him in the face and and she, you know, he doesn't succeed. Um, or she survives when she shouldn't have survived. Uh, maybe he drops a knife when he shouldn't have dropped the knife. You know, <laughs> all kinds of things. You just screw up because you've never done it before. And then after you get through that one, if the police don't come knocking, then you start getting a little bit, you stop think. you start thinking a little more, going, okay, that didn't go well. What should I do to make, to do a, a better job? And so in the middle, things go very well. Then over time, what happens is people tend to get sloppy. Uh, they've done it so much. They've gotten away with it so much. They get careless. That's when they make their, their they start making mistakes. So it's in the beginning and it's at the end. And this is also true for police. A police, the most likely time for a police officer to get killed is in the beginning of his career and at the end of his career. In the beginning, because he doesn't know what he's doing. At the end, because he's gotten very uh, lackadaisical. So, you know, I'm about two years from retirement. I've been out here 18 years. Nothing's happened to me yet. Gets careless. So, same kind of thing. So, this guy, which is interesting, is he got caught because he did something well, he got he either had bad luck or he did something stupid. Now, uh, let's see if I can find the other thing that nah, I'm gonna try to find the one I can't see. God, I wish they weren't so small so I can't see what I'm looking at. <laughs> so annoying. Um, maybe it's here. Hold on a second. Okay. No, that's not it. I knew it wasn't gonna be it. Oh, so annoying. Uh, that's why I say it's an educational channel. You're being educated. Hang in. All right. Maybe it's over here. Um, I want to point it out because there was the, this is from the profiler guy. Uh, let me, let me check. Okay. Not that one. <laughs> I'm not going to find it. Okay. That's the one I just did. 
Yeah, well, okay, that's not it. Yeah, well, where'd it go? Yeah, oh, crap. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to muck around here because I put it here somewhere. But say it's, you see big pictures, I see tiny, weeny little pictures. Okay, I'm just going to try to tell you what, maybe it's this guy. Um, nope, where, where did one go? Yeah, hold on a second, hold on a second, maybe it's here. No, it's not here either. Okay, I'm going to have to tell you what he said because I can't find it. So not. Okay. So anyway, what the what the profiler dude said, which I thought was good, as he said, um, let me put up, let me put this guy back here. Okay. What he said was that um that he's picked a weird location to take take his victim. He actually picked her up and then he drove like 40 kilometers or something. He could have, he had all this space between where he picked her up and where he grabbed her and where he drove her. He had all this open farmland and all kinds of bogs and everything, but he didn't choose them. He went near, right near to his home, right near to his home in an area where he was comfortable. Now, this is not unusual for serial killers. A lot of times they do dump bodies near their home because they know where the police are. They know what, what Lone Road doesn't have teenagers hanging out on it. Uh, they know where there's not going to, there's not going to be a problem. So a lot of times bodies are dumped where they're very comfortable um, as opposed to driving out and you never know what you're going to run into. But he, I think brought her back because he thought, Hey, this is a land area. I know this is an area where I go hunting and all kinds of stuff like that. I know it's out here. Except in that moment, he was a hunter and he goes to the area that he hunts in and what happened was he got caught by hunters, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Um, so he, uh, what he did was he he, he had this girl, um, this woman, and he, he that's unnamed, and he takes her and he's raped her more than once in many ways. And now he gets to this location, and he's he's um there are two hunters that show up in the area. He puts a plastic bag over the victim's head, tries to put her into the boot of the car. And then she falls out and she's discovered by the hunters because he's in a rush now. He's freaking out. And the hunters find him, find the girl, and she have to convince her, we're not here to kill you. And um, and they also oddly recognized him. <laughs> so he had really bad luck. Which means to me, was this his first crime? Or was this one of his later crimes where he just got careless and wasn't really thinking and paying attention? He was dubbed the Beast of Bolton Glass. Murphy was arrested, pleaded guilty to the rape and attempted murder of a woman in the Wicklow Mountains of Carlo. But he was just sentenced. He was sentenced to 15 years and only did 10. Now, when he was behind bars, he alluded to committing other, other crimes um, because, well, because the police were wondering. Oh, this is, hey, I was sitting right in front of the stupid thing. See, a rational person would uh, do it as far away from where they live. And he says, but the nearest place that he knew in, was intimately. He knew this intimately. That's, oh, it was right behind me. I didn't see it. Oops. So anyway, that's what, that, and it's true. I mean, you know, he could have dumped the body some, or she was going to kill her. This is the case where she, he was talking about giving his name and chatting with her. She knew she was dead. Because he didn't, he wasn't masked. He was telling her too much information. She wasn't going to live, and she knew it. Um, and he put plastic bag over her head. I don't know if he's going to suffocate her that way, strangle her, suffocate. But he was definitely intending to leave her somewhere in the mountains. Um, and the hunters saved her life, essentially. So, but here was something else he said. Um, he said that. Uh, let's see, I have a better one of this. Um, oh, he's basically saying here that. Uh, he knows all this area that it's a great place to put bodies, but he says this, they'll never find my DNA. Now, why would they never find his DNA? Um, because according to the woman he was attacking, I don't hear anything from her that he used a condom. So why is he thinking they won't find DNA? Now it may be that, um, he didn't get to put her in the right place, but, um, I wonder, there's, when we look at these six women, these women that are all missing, bodies never found, bodies never found. Now, it's funny because these three women are, are theoretical victims of serial killers. And they're supposed to be those brilliant guys who are going to make sure, you know, they're, they're so smart, right? The married men with two kids in their 30s or whatever. They're so smart, they're going to make sure the bodies aren't found. But these, these women, 
they were theoretically killed by someone they knew in some kind of frenzy or whatever. They weren't supposedly serial killers. So why did these three guys also know how to get rid of bodies and never have them found again? <laughs> Makes you wonder. But I'm going to say you got too many bogs in Ireland. Bogs. You're bogged down with bogs. Uh, and why is that so important? Because bogs are watery. Very, very watery. And they also have a bit of an acidic quality to them. How long any kind of DNA, semen DNA, would last in those bogs is not very long. And so if you can just get out in the middle of nowhere and dump that body into a bog and cover it up, you're home free. So I think that he darn well knows um, that uh, if, and he's indicating he did it before, and I believe he did do it before. I believe he is a serial killer. Well, he's obviously a serial killer, um, but that he, but we just don't know which other ones he did, right? So let me find this one here. Um, so yeah, uh, so he, I'm having trouble finding the right spots again. This is not going well for me today. What the heck? Okay, this one I'm trying to find. So yeah, that um, he doesn't think they're going to find his DNA. And I, I believe, and again, I don't think he, because he used condoms, I think because he believes he's, the bodies aren't going to be found when they're found, it's going to be too late because of the water. Now he said this too, which is kind of funny. Uh, somebody said, uh, did they find a body? And then he, they're like, did you find a body? And then they say, no. And he says, well, I'll fuck off then. You know, <laughs> he knows. You don't have a body. You don't have a case. Let out in 10 years. This guy, and that really pissed people off. He got out after 10 years. Young man. He's been running around Europe. Um, I think he's in the U he's in, he's somewhere in England right now. They put out a dangerous serial killer. So, killer. He's not kidding. <laughs> he's, a, he's a serial, serious killer. No, he's a serious serial killer. He's a serial killer. There's no question that woman would have been dead if she if somebody hadn't intervened and the serial rapists are often serial killers too. So no matter what, if you're a serial predator, a sexual predator, what the heck are they doing? Letting you out in 10 years, but he's out. Is he committing more crimes? How do we know? He may well be, he, he may, it's possible. He decided it's too dangerous to commit the crimes. He's not going to do it anymore. But then again, if he has the opportunity, who's to stop him? And if he's gotten away with it more than once, which he probably has, um, except for this one bad turn he had, um, he could easily do it in whatever country he's in and jump from country to country uh, committing crimes. And he should never have been, never seen the light of day again, but he is out there. Um, did he commit these other crimes? Well, if we take a look back at uh, Deidre Jacob, this is the one crime he may have committed that they, they have a more link to than any other. Now here she is here. Um, what happened was she was um, last seen in a bank uh, and then she disappeared. She, she left the bank, walked to a toward a house and, and somebody grabbed her, chucked him in, a, in his vehicle in the boot of the car, <laughs> took off. That some people think that's him. Nah, it's not a clear picture, but a lot of people think it's him. Some people say it isn't, but he also was doing work in the area at the time. So he's working in the area. They think it looks like him. The MO is very similar. Uh, could it be him? Sure. Can they prove it? No. And if he found a good bog to put her into uh, and the DNA is gone, they'll never prove it. So, He's a good suspect in this case, but that's all it is. He's a good suspect. Uh, and that's why you can't solve a lot of cases because nobody, first of all, you can't prove the person has been murdered. You, I mean, most likely they have, you know, chances of them running away aren't excellent, but also doesn't mean they were murdered. Could have committed suicide, could have had an accident somewhere, and they could have run away. So you can't even prove the murder. Even if you, even if you say, yes, he's working right there. And boy, that everybody says it, Sam, you can't prove him. You cannot prove it. So this case is going to remain open with the possibility that it could be him. Um, and that would be, and, and I believe she was, she was kidnapped by a serial killer. And I, he is a serial killer, but there's other serial killers out there as well. So 
we have the case, the first case I was talking about, um, you know, in 2018. I mean, you have a lovely woman. She also was grabbed, thrown into a boot of a car. Now, it's a very similar case. And you, how would you know these? You would think maybe if you hadn't caught that guy, that it was linked to maybe, maybe Murphy. You think, well, it's Murphy who did it. Well, it wasn't Murphy who did that one. It clearly wasn't him. It was a different person entirely. But their MO was very, very similar. But And why is it similar? Well, if you're kidnapping somebody, you either have to point a gun and a gun at them and make them get into your car, or you have to smash their face in or grab them and throw them in the boot of your car. You've got two choices when you're abducting people. So chances are it's going to look similar. Then when you get somewhere and, and then can take them out of the car to do what you want to them, chances are you're going to rape them, which all looks the same. And then you're going to get to the point of how are you going to kill them? Because they have seen your face uh, and now you got to do them in unless you're wearing a mask. Because sometimes women survive when a guy um, doesn't believe he can be, you know, identified or when he crawls in a window with a mask on or something. Well, you, you kidnap somebody, you don't have a mask on, you've got to kill that person. And so then how do you kill them? Uh, and most of the time it's strangulation. And in this case, we have, a, you know, a, the plastic bag issue, which pops up in another case. But the question is, is that the same is that the same person because somebody used a plastic bag in two, in two different cases, you have plastic bags. Does that make it linked? It's unusual, but then again, I'm gonna show you the second case that might was had plastic bags and I don't necessarily think that, that Murphy did that one. So see how confusing, and this is what the police have to go through. They must lose their damn minds. So let me, let me just check in on some of your comments and I'll go to some of the other cases um, about it. Um, Let's see. Uh, um, I'm not sure I understand that. Um, you need to prove he's 51% more likely he did it than he didn't. No, absolutely not. You need to prove 100% that he did it. 51% is not, not, that's not a problem. You know, you could get, pro well, you could get probable cause out of that, but, but the problem is they don't want to arrest somebody when they don't have when there's not enough and you can have re massive reasonable doubt and you can think the guy did it, but you're not going to eat like, yeah, this isn't going to go anywhere. Um, so in this case, they tried, they wanted to pin it on Murphy. They, they sent this in, but they, they, they said, we're not going, we're not going to go, we're not going to arrest the guy. Why? Because there's no proof he did it. There isn't. I mean, do I think he probably did it? I'm leaning that way. But even if I were on a jury, I could say I have no way to prove he did it just because he's working in the area and there's a guy that looks like him, sort of. That's not proof because you can't really see who it is. Now, if we could see it was him, yeah. But we you have to have a lot. Um, um, didn't he confess? Uh, he confessed to a bunch of stuff. But, the, you know, Confessions aren't always that useful, especially when they come from another inmate. Because first of all, we have to believe we don't know if we should believe the inmate. <laughs> Unless the inmate says he said this and it's something only the killer would have known and the police. Um, inmates will inmates will tell stories all the time just to get people in trouble. Um no, yeah, it's not enough. It's not enough. It really isn't enough, which is sad. Um so I'm, I'm laughing at some no don't don't go there the back at the nancy ing thing no not not nancy ing <laughs> that's in guatemala i don't think he's been there um uh no i think he would think he left no dna because he's using a condom which people do use condoms especially after dna became popular to be you know to solve crimes then condoms were have been used quite often uh but i think it's the box I think it's the knowledge that the girl has been sitting in a bog for a really long time um, that then you might suspect that, yeah, he, he might have done that one. Um, point out the other one he might have done, but here's an interesting question. Did he do this one or not? Um, and this would be, see if I can, let me see if I can find it. I don't like when I have so many pictures. I can't, you know, I can't, I can't locate them. It's so annoying. Um, this one. Ah, first try. That's awesome. Um, no, that's not it. <laughs> that's, that's not what I was looking for. Damn it. <laughs> that's another case. There's so many cases. I can't even get to, I haven't even gotten to the ones that are, we're talking about, but I, I'm pointing these out because 
um, it, it's fascinating to see how many people are out there. This one, just let me let me point out this one because this is actually um, Phyllis Murphy. Phyllis Murphy here. And the reason this one's interesting is this guy's name is John Kerr. Luckily, he's dead. He died of a lung disease, thank God. But she was Phyllis Murphy. And this happened. Let me tell you when this happened. Just so, so you can see how many cases there are that the police are actually dealing with. This happened in 1979. So this is prior, prior to the, the Vanishing Triangle. Um, this guy, um, he's a former Army sergeant. He raped and murdered Phyllis Murphy, who vanished on her way home from Christmas shopping on December 22nd, 1979. Um, he served 20 years. For, uh, oh. Wait a minute. Okay, now I'm lost here. Okay. Let's see, now he's he's a serial killer too, but it gets very it gets very confusing. Um, he, what happened here was he was a dad of five. He was nailed twenty years after the killing of Phyllis. Why? Because there was DNA that finally got him, putting him at the scene of the crime. Her naked and battered body was found in a remote area near Wicklow Gap. She had been beaten, raped, and strangled. Um. He lived just a few doors away from Phyllis's family in Kildare Town. He had an alibi. And, and this is interesting. What happens when people have alibis? You go to the place of work, you say, was he at work? And, and the boss says he was at work. That's an alibi. And you think, well, the boss wouldn't lie. Well, apparently the boss did lie because he didn't want to, he didn't want to get his friend in trouble. So he did lie. Um, he said, he, he said, oh, he was here that day. And he's even kept that, even said that in spite of the fact that he also saw him cleaning out his car, like washing it out. But um, he, uh, what happened with him? Um, he was given an alibi by a work colleague who said he was at the security hut at Black & Decker plant the night of the murder. However, a breakthrough came in 1997 when Patty Bol Bolger told uh, the guards that he had been late for work that night and had washed out the boot of his car on the site. Okay, so, so somebody else is telling a different story, but that was many, many, many years later. She has fought for her life, suffered more than 30 injuries, and it took them 20 years. But her body uh, was left under a tree. He didn't put her in a bog. <laughs> so they caught him because she wasn't in a bog. Um, there is also the case of one more case, and I'm going to go to the, the people that, um, let's see, I'll find the other one. Mm, there's, there's just so many. Uh, there is also, where did that one go? Uh, I tell you, there's just, there's just so many. I mean, this is, this is where I started getting completely lost myself when I was looking at this book and reading things, um, there were just incredible numbers of cases. And that's what she ran into. So when you're looking at the vanishing triangle, you've got three people probably murdered by people they knew, but they never found their bodies. So where are they? They weren't clever people. They just found bogs to stuff them in. Um, but uh, let's see. Um, I also want to point, I want to point out this other ones. Um, yeah, that was okay. So there was another one where, okay, so Antoinette Smith. Let me see if I can find Antoinette Smith. I know you're all going to get lost in all of this because it's just so complicated. It really is. Um, and uh, Antoinette Smith was another one, and she was from 1987. Uh, no suspects at all in her murder. She was 27, the mother of two young girls, and she went off for the evening to see a David Bowie concert. And then she went to have some drinks in Dublin. She left her friend around two in the morning. Uh, and then she um, got in a taxi and the taxi driver said he picked up a woman who sounded like Antoinette along with two men, taking them a few miles out of town towards a place called Rathfrenham. Um, the men had given an uncomfortable feeling, making jokes about killing him and taking the car. Uh, police weren't able to work out who these men might be or if it was even Antoinette with them. I also wonder whether the taxi driver is just lying. <laughs> he could have been the one to kill her. Um, no one was ever caught for murdering Antoinette. Her body wasn't found for almost a year, buried in Bogland uh, in Wicklow. 
Uh, this is very uh, close to Enniscary, which is where Justine Val Valdez's body was found, um, where she was abducted. Uh, and also where the first triangle disappearance took place in 1993. And that would be the one that they make most of this story about. Um, and that's where she disappeared. All right. Now, interestingly, when they found uh, the, the body uh, way back when of Antoinette, she had two bags over her head, two plastic bags over her head, which is very similar to the, the Murphy case where he's putting bags over that woman's head who survived. Did he commit that crime? Well, at that time, she was 22 years old. I'm sorry, he was 22. He wasn't a married man with two kids. He was a 22-year-old. Could he have committed that crime when he was 22? Maybe. Does the FBI profile fit that crime? I don't know. And this is what the police look at. They got all of these darn crimes, and they're trying to figure out if, if you put woman in the boot, does that make you the boot, the boot serial killer? Well, apparently not, because I've got more than one here that put women in the boot. Um, plastic bags, I got more than one. Is it the same guy or is it two different guys of plastic bags? Uh, they also think that Antoinette might have been with two guys. Is it possible that two guys are involved in some of these crimes? Sure, they've got all of that. They've got that mess. Um, See, it just gets, it gets so incredibly complicated. It really, really, really does. Um, let's see. I'm just going to look through her story here. I just want to look at some of these other ones. Um, so these men that were caught later, it says, she says, did one of these men kill the women in the 90s? Or were there several murders operating in the triangle areas at the same time? Is the violent death of women actually more common in Ireland than we'd like to admit? Yes, Probably. And, you know, she points out that maybe, maybe I was, I've, I've been stupid to feel safe, to wander freely about the countryside as a child and a young girl. I thought when I was growing up, the world was safe. I never thought about serial killers. Even after my teens, it never crossed my mind. Why? Because our media was mostly local. It was mostly local. And so unless it happened in your town, you never heard about it. And so I, I remember hearing things like, you know, it was perfectly safe to, to hitchhike in the 70s. And they're saying that true for Ireland, too. It was perfectly safe for women to hitchhike. It's never been safe for women to hitchhike. It's never been safe for women to walk down a country road. It's never been safe for women to jog where there are nothing but trees. Never been safe. It's never been safe to be in certain relationships, either. It's never been safe to be in prostitution. It's never been safe to take drugs. Never. Why? Because it makes you vulnerable. And it, might, and it isolates you from other human beings so that bad guys, because the psychopaths are out there, can kill you. And either they find you dead and don't know who did it, or they never find you, depending on whether the guy can put your body someplace where it's, and you're looking at this. Okay, Ireland happens to have a whole lot of places to put people's bodies. It does. Uh, very useful area. Um, a lot of countryside and a lot of bogs. And the bogs are great for that. Um, it's the same thing in the U.S. If you can if you can get into a mountainous area, you can put a body down a ravine. You're not going to find that body. Maybe maybe 20 years later, some some hiker will come through and 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 stumble over the body and go, oh my God. But you know, if you if if you, somebody disappears, and they go looking for them, where are they going to look for them? When you've got so many bloody ravines, you can't find them. And you can make shallow graves easily and animals can disperse bones and you can find caves and you can find mines and you can, you know, shh. then there's wells and then there's water, you know, and, and Ireland has a whole pile of water around it too. So no, women have never been safe in Ireland any more than been safe in the U S it's just, we didn't know about these things. And so when we're looking at the triangle stuff, which suddenly is a big deal, uh, we really have these three women in that period of five years, which appear to maybe have been, uh, do appear to have been victims of a serial killer or what, two serial killers or three serial killers. Because if we find all these other cases where a guy's not even caught for 20 years, what do you think he's been doing for 20 years? And it, it didn't have to be in the triangle. You know, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here. There's all these other cases. See, we already have cases outside. So there's cases everywhere. 
And if you actually go back and look at the records, um, if you can find them, it's, it's astronomical. I mean, how many murders there actually are. And this is what she was writing in her book, which I say is a little confusing, but that's why it may, that's why it's so interesting that, you know, uh, there's that many extra murders out there that they just don't know. Um, so let me go to let me go to the three the the one the three the three here. Um, now Annie um, McCarrick, um, I think I said her name wrong before. I said McCarrick. McCarrick. Um, she was actually an American who was living in Ireland, and her her father was a police uh, officer in in the U.S. And they thought she was in you know so she was so happy in Ireland, so safe, so safe, you know. But was she safe? Um, because like every other country, all you have to do is be in the wrong place at the wrong time. So what happened to Annie McCarrick? All right. What happened to her? Um, let's see. She, she, she had gone to the store. Um, she, um, I think I have a, let's see if I can find my picture of her. Okay. Not that one. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try to find it guys. Hold on a second. Yeah, there we go. Okay. She was at, she was at home and she went out shopping. She brought some groceries back. She's going to ha have some friends the next day. So she dropped the groceries back at her house and then she caught a bus and people saw her catching the bus. Okay. Uh, but the last photo sighting, she was actually, they do have a picture of her. I think it's in, in the bank. She went to the bank. That's her on, on, on CCTV. Then she, she runs out to catch a bus to Enniscary. Um, and to walk the foothills of Wicklow Mountains. Now, this, we're talking about walking the foothills. All right, again, um, alone. Or was she? Now, she asked a friend to go with her. Friend was not available. They have no evidence that any other phone calls went to anybody else. So she might have just decided, well, I'm just going to take myself a walk. Or did she meet somebody? Did she meet somebody on the walk? Did she meet somebody? Did she find somebody else, you know, that she knew and she just went down the street and knocked on their door? They don't know. She got on the bus by herself, though. So she gets on the bus. Um, and then she's supposedly walking around somewhere. Then where she's supposedly walking around, about four miles from there, or, 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 or four kilometers, I'm not sure which, which it was, she shows up supposedly at a place called Johnny Fox's. And she enters the pub. It's at the base of the mountains. And she's followed by a man who pays her entrance fee. And so they they have a description of him. Uh, about in his 20, late 20s. Uh, 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 10. A square jaw. All right. They got that. Um, but after she left, supposedly they believe it's her. They, have, they think they didn't know it was her. But they have people that describe her and they believe it's her but they believe it's her. Um, you would think if it was a different woman, she would have said, no, 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 that was me at Johnny Fox's. Now, the guy has never come forward. Now, why doesn't a guy come forward if he's the last person seen with a girl who gets murdered <laughs> or goes missing? Probably because he doesn't want to identify himself. Now, that's either because he's afraid he's going to be accused of something he didn't do, or he's afraid he's going to be accused of something he did do. So that guy's never been, never been identified, never been found. But if that was her here, which they believe it was, when she left, she was never seen again. And that's that. Never seen again. Clearly, she loved Ireland. She was having a great time. She was looking forward to her family coming over. She was having. She didn't run away. She wasn't doing drugs. Uh, she wasn't committing suicide. So she was clearly abducted at some point by someone. So either, you know, where this guy came out of, I don't know. Um, I can't imagine that she wasn't, she, I don't know if there was any buses running at that point. So how does she, was she planning to get home? Um, that's kind of confusing to me too. Cause if she's out at the, um, out at the pub pretty late. I don't know. You know, it's at the foot of the mountain. Maybe she can catch a bus from there. It's possible she left with the guy and they went their separate ways and she got kidnapped right off the road, but nobody has a clue because her body's never been found. And, so that's just going to stand the way it is. Um, could have been anybody. Now, the next the next girl that went missing, also missing, I believe, that year. Uh, she was 1993. And then we have a 1990, oh, 1995. We have a, a woman they call a JoJo. Um, uh, 
this was shown in the movie. Uh, a girl who goes to a pub, she leaves the, the she misses the bus um, and can't get home. So she has to hitchhike and she does catch a ride and the ride only could take her halfway. So then she calls a friend from a phone booth and says, hey, you know, I'm on my way. Uh, I'm looking for another ride. Oh, wait, here's a guy who's going to give me a ride. And that's the last she's seen. Body never been found. It was clear she was hitchhiking. No question about it. Uh, so there's not somebody, she did not, the person on the other end of the phone knows that she wasn't picking a car that she knew the person. She wasn't killed by her boyfriend or anything like that. She jumped in a car and was never seen again. Deidre is the one I already talked about who was got off, was walking right near her house when she got grabbed and put in the boot of a car and driven off. I would say all three of those women were kidnapped by serial killers. But we don't know if it's one, two, or three. And we don't know, since they clearly are serial kind of serial killer crimes, this, again, not something somebody's only going to do once. The other three women, well, there's issues in their lives. They hooked up with the wrong person. The police believe they know who killed all three of these women. And they're all three, they're three different people. Uh, they can't prove it, though, because they don't have the body. So bogs are good for people who aren't serial killers, too. <laughs> now, the other thing I just want to point out is that just because they know who killed these women also doesn't mean they couldn't be serial killers. You know, sometimes a serial killer will kill somebody close to him and then kill strangers or vice versa. Um, so it doesn't mean they're not serial killers. It just means that they had connections as opposed to the other three women who didn't have connections. But as you see from the from the book that I'm reading from, how many people just they just disappear here and there. And I haven't even gotten into the long. I'm not going to go through the whole long list because I'm already lost myself um, because there's so many different ones um, that went missing. But there there is um, a bunch of things that uh, when people go missing, one of the problems is. There are, if you look at how many people go missing and then turn back up, this is why the 24 hour thing went in the, um, in the movie, one of the things you see in the movie is um, this scene here where you got the, 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 the mother and the sister of the victim. She's got, this is the one that's based on Jojo. So say they're, um, they're, 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 uh, the girl went to the phone booth and then vanished. And they're like, no, she wouldn't have run away. She definitely was kidnapped. She was kidnapped. And then over here we have the police officer looking at her like, whatever. And he goes, you got to come back in 24 hours. And that 24-hour rule isn't just an Irish rule. It's a U.S. rule, too. Why do we do 24 hours? It's because the majority of people who disappear. And I think they pointed out in, in the show, it's like 565 people have disappeared. And they and almost 99% of them returned within 24 hours, if not 48 hours or 72 hours, or maybe even a few years later. The problem is most people who disappear come back. So the police only have so many resources and they cannot go after every single, you know, the minute some mother pops up and says, oh, my daughter, my daughter's been kidnapped. They can't throw their entire police force and all their resources into try, you know, finding that, that, 19 year old girl only to find out that she was over at a friend's house doing some kind of drugs. And she, she, she passed out and she, the next day she would have come home. They can't do that. So they always say 24 hours to at least eliminate the majority of people who just show back up now to point out also, which is true. The majority of the time, by the time you catch somebody if let's say within 24 hours you just disperse remember the one i said where they saw the girl being taken away right they saw her being kidnapped literally saw her being kidnapped um let me put her back up here um did she go in my little teeny weeny pictures that annoy the heck out of me <laughs> i really hate the fact they're so small okay was it no that's not that one god i cannot see there we go um they saw her being pushed into the boot of a car. They saw her against another car. They had people rushing after this guy. They still found her dead. 
Why is that? Because very few guys who commit sexual homicides keep their victims alive for very long. And as you know, especially when you're talking about children, uh, a lot of times people say, well, you know, the, 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 some child predator kidnaps this three-year-old off the street or a seven-year-old or whatever, and they're like, they think they're going to find them alive. Within an hour, they're dead. Why? Because the urge that they have to commit this crime, the desire to have this thrilling experience, most of them, if they're grabbing them, are bringing them to some isolated place as quickly as possible so they can rape them. And once they're done raping them, they kill them because they're not going to leave them alive. They're dead within a very short period of time. On rare, rare, rare occasions, a person might be kidnapped and kept at somebody's home in their basement or in a shed or whatever. It's extremely rare. And of course, we hear about those cases and then we base everything on, okay, we're going to Every case of a missing person, we're going to treat as if they've been kidnapped by a serial killer who has them in a dungeon <laughs> and, you know, under his house. So we should, you know, but that's not the way it really works the majority of the time. And so when you have the anomaly, you know, it's hard to base how you do things on an anomaly. Uh, so would these women have been saved if the police had, within 24 hours, had raced off and found, to try to find them? Probably not. They're probably been dead within a couple hours. So chances are, no, they wouldn't find them alive. Would, would they be able, maybe, well, I'd say unless they got lucky, they're, they're still not going to be able to trace down who did it, um, which would be good because even if the woman ends up dead, they can prevent other women from being murdered. That would be nice. Um, but it's very, very tricky. And then, and then here's the other thing that happens. Uh, the family will come in and they will be all mad. So why don't you do, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why are you, why are you looking into her background? Well, because her background might tell us what happened to her. Um, you don't like it because you want to believe that, you know, you, you're, you know, you're a perfect angel, but that's not the way it works. Um, uh, let's see. I'm trying to find this other one. If I can find it. Yeah. And that's not it. Um, that's not it. God bless. I'm just in a loss today. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to click on things now. I really think this program ought to have very bigger spaces so you could actually see. Um, no, this is what I was looking for. Um, when, the, when, when, when the family comes in and gets mad at the police and says, you're not showing any emotion, you don't seem to care. Well, they, there's true that police can be kind of come across coldly and they should not maybe, they should have a better methodology of coming across. And that's sometimes why you have victims advocates working in police departments that are a little bit better at being kinder and softer. But as he says, you have to stay emotionally detached and you have to look at the cold, hard facts. That is true. You can, you can, you can have all, when I look at things and that's what people say, well, how'd you know somebody, you just talk about these things and people and you laugh and you, you know, whatever. I'm looking at facts. I'm, uh, I'm not sitting here telling, you know, I mean, I, do I feel sorry for the families? Absolutely. Do I think it's a horrible thing that these women died and didn't get to live out the rest of their lives and probably at horrible deaths? Absolutely. Not an emotional, soulless human being. But if I'm talking about crime and if I'm going to investigate a crime or pro profile a crime, I'm looking at cold, hard facts. Where was she? Who, you know, what happened prior to when she went missing? And then you have to look at, were they depressed? Were they, did they do drugs? Were they into prostitution? Were they, did they have bad boyfriends? You have to look at those. Those are facts. And they might help lead the investigation in a direction or not. Um, uh, but families, oftentimes, they, do, they don't want you to look at the facts. They just want you to run around and, you know, sort of just, I don't know what they think. They think it's some kind of magical thing where a police officer can just jump in a vehicle and somehow race into the countryside and, and figure out where the person went to. Um, but you're talking to people, uh, witnesses who half the time aren't even correct. You're talking to people who lie about where they where they were, where their friend was, because they don't want to get involved or they don't want to get somebody in trouble. Uh, it's all kinds of issues you run into. It's not an easy job. And that was one of the nice things about the book um, was that she was like, I had this kind of negative attitude toward the police. But as I started understanding how hard it was, I started getting a little bit more like, oh, that's what's causing some of the problem, you know, is these are very difficult crimes to solve. How do we know 
who's doing what, when we don't have a body, we don't have a witness to the crime. And even sometimes if we have somewhat of a witness or we have some information, it's not enough to put the guy away. And you might like to, you might even say, I know who did it, but you can't, you got to have enough so that you don't go into court and there's reasonable doubt. Um, so these women, these three, yes, I think one, two or three serial killers. Um, and you have creepy Murphy and he certainly is a, a guy who I think committed more crimes. Um, he has a cousin, interestingly enough, a cousin who also committed a homicide, sexual homicide. He was a married guy and he, he was leaving work and uh, the woman was coming. She had been out shopping and he attacked her in a park um, and he raped and murdered her in the park. And then he went home to his wife. Um, and the only reason he got caught was it was a very cold, it was very cold, unreasonably, unseasonably cold. And the DNA that he left at the scene didn't disintegrate. They said if it had been 14 days later, they wouldn't have had it. But because it was cold, they've got DNA. And it was just at the time when DNA was becoming popular. So he did get arrested um, but and, and charged. But a lot of times you just don't have anything. What are you going to do? Even if you find her body now in a bog someplace, if there's no DNA, how are you going to arrest the guy that did that? I don't know. Uh, unless he dropped his uh, driver's license on top of her or... Uh, you know, he left something that tells you who it was. Um, yeah, because, you know, yeah, I don't know how you'd, how you'd prove it. So this, this is the problem with serial, serial crimes. Uh, they're not very easy. And when you go back and look into, into the his, history, into the past, you find out there's way more. <laughs> All these guys pop out of the woodwork. And how many of them are married with two kids? A whole bunch of them. So even if you want to believe the FBI profile, you can't necessarily prove which one of the married guys with two kids it even is. I mean, it's, it's that crazy. And then maybe it isn't a married guy with two kids. Maybe it happens to be a 28 year old with no kids and no wife at all. Just because he grabbed her and threw her in a car doesn't mean that he has to be a married guy with two kids. That's stupid. You know, um, that's not proof that that, that, that profile is just junk. Um, but there's also serial rapists running around and we haven't even, I'm not even going to get into that, but there's, you know, lots of serial rapists out there and serial rapists become serial killers. And sometimes serial killers go back to serial raping. So, you know, your suspect list can be very long with people who are a lot of creepy dudes. On the other hand, sometimes you got nobody. You just don't have anybody you can prove was any place near that person. And when that, that happened and, and there you are, you're screwed. Um, so that's, that's the reality of it. Um, I'm going to try to go back to my book here, but I'm going to look at your comments. Um, I, I wanted to go through some of the things in the book just because I thought there were such interesting statements that she made, but it is, it is very overwhelming. That's why I recommend you read the book and I'll link it. Um, uh, can you, <laughs> can you prove it? Well, that's the problem. Um, Uh, yes. Um, in a familiar area, you have more chance of being recognized, but think about this as well. You also have, if you're in, if you're in a familiar area, let's say somebody sees me walking through the woods near my house. Shouldn't I be walking through the woods near my house? Why not? On the other hand, if let's say, let's say, um, a car that looks like my little red Mazda car, were seen out in, um, hmm, I don't know. Let me, let me, let me think of, I'm trying to think of a little weird place. Um, Glen Echo, Glen Echo, Maryland. Okay. It's, it's got, there's a, there's a park there called Glen Echo Park. Anyway, that's actually an amusement park or it was, I think it's gone, but anyway, so some, they see a red monster and then Pat Brown is found and there was a body that was found in that area. And then Pat Brown was seen walking around that area. They would say, what the hell are you doing over here? You never, you've never been here before. You don't have a job over here. You don't have any friends over here. What are you doing over here? But if my car is seen a mile from my house and I'm seen walking around a mile from my house, that's where I live. So unless I actually am killing somebody at the time, like was Murphy, Murphy's problem was 
<laughs> that they actually saw him attacking her and then they did recognize him. So, but if they had just seen him in the area, they would have said, well, that's, that's, that's Murphy. He's always around. He's another hunter and he would not necessarily have been a suspect. So in one way, it's useful um, to actually be doing stuff in an area that you, you know, you're not going to be a, a, a strange person to be there. Uh, but also you also usually you're more aware of where you should go and where you shouldn't go, where you can go that it's a quiet place. They're not going to find you. Um, uh, and a lot of times when people take somebody away from the area they live, they will still pick something they're familiar with. Like they'll drive like, like two hours away, but it's to uncle Milton's farm, <laughs> you know, and they'll, and they'll bury the body on a, a corner of his farm because they know that area. Yeah. So, but you know, it, it, there's nothing absolute, and and that's one of the problems with any of these things. Not absolute. <laughs> I'm a boot man. How about you? <laughs> yeah, you know, there's only so many places in the car you put people inside or in the boot. I mean, you got the two choices. You know, um, uh, let's say. Um, Uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, Pat, Mickey Murphy, Bettina Pichelle was his victim in 2001. The, okay. The Valdez case is eerily similar. Oh yeah. Okay. This is the cousin. Okay. This is Bettina. Yes. Bettina's body was found 15 days after her disappearance. So initially she was added to the triangle. Mm. And, and this was the one who was just walking home to her house, um, and was killed in the park. Uh, so yeah, um, but uh, I think I think she, I think I'm trying to remember. Just say say there's so many cases I can't even keep track of them. Um, but yeah, you know whether the whole problem with putting people in the triangle or not in the triangle, the triangle is really fairly meaningless, <laughs> you know, because it may well be that the women that she could be have killed by a serial killer who killed completely outside that triangle another time, maybe five years prior, because a lot of times there's good space between murders. I mean, it's serial killers don't murder every month with the moon or even every year. Sometimes they, they have downtime and they kill when, even the, so the guy gets pissed off because his, his wife is dumping him and he's in a bad mood. So he goes and kills. Yeah. And then maybe he gets a girlfriend and he's good for a few years and uh, he has a job and all that. And then the girlfriend dumps him. So he kills again. They usually have this point where they're decompensating in the sense that they're losing their power in society. And in order to get their power back and get their rage out, they choose to commit uh, a sexual homicide that makes them feel good uh, and get their power back, you know, and and they do it and they go, now, now I'm good. And so they're not necessarily going to run out the next week. Now you do a serial killers who are very, very busy, very busy bees, but it's not necessarily so. So you can have overlaps. You could have, she's killed by this guy, but let's say Murphy, let's say Murphy killed Jacob as well as the one he got caught for. Um, and then, but he didn't do Annie. So there's another guy that did Annie, but did the Annie guy do Joe, Jojo? Or, or did this person who killed her, actually have two other homicides that aren't they aren't inside the triangle or you know who knows maybe they they're people they thought disappeared maybe they thought they did run away and they're not even listed as a homicide so it, it's just massively difficult and this is what and when the, the police supposedly when they got the triangle one they were told another remit thing they were told look at these six cases and they didn't know why they had to look at those six cases, but they were told to look at those six cases, period. So they did. Now, was it possibly because the media was pushing them, that kind of thing? It could be very political, uh, why those six cases were chosen. And then, of course, they said eventually, well, we three, we believe, you know, have nothing to do with any serial killer. Uh, these three, we think um, they had different guys working on each one of the cases. A lot of the guys that were really not trained in this at all. And a lot of the places that the girls, girls go missing or women go missing, you have small towns with, with un, untrained detectives. Um, and God knows what they missed or what they, what they, no, what they 
they jump to in their conclusions and and therefore um and somebody was saying how <laughs> made a comment how it was better in the u.s as far as catching these guys and it isn't it isn't good <laughs> look how many cases we have in the united states which are unsolved uh you know we have tons of unsolved cases we have ones that do get solved like the one just recently the uh lakin case um uh, Lake and Riley um, down in the University of uh, Georgia. Well, the guy's an idiot who killed her, um, you know, um, but he, he he easily is a serial killer. And if he, if he hadn't been so stupid by getting caught on CCTV and having people point and say, it's that guy um, and throw away the bloody clothes. And he just, he was just not very good at what he did. Um, but if he'd gotten away with it, maybe he'd go on to killing, I don't know how many other people, but the Rachel Morin case, which is now, uh, the one in Maryland, which I've talked about, it's it, that's a clear serial killer. Um, but that's been over, let's see, August. Now it's nine months, it's eight months. It's been eight months. They haven't caught the guy. And you can you can look at, you can just look, if you look at 50 states in the United States and every one of the cities in the United States and even some small towns, you're going to have women who've been raped and murdered. And they're just listed someplace. They're just in a police file someplace. And I could go back in time and talk about how many cases are still open in the Maryland, Washington, D.C. area, um, Virginia, right? My area. Tons of cases are still open cold cases that they've never solved. <laughs> and other ones they've solved, but they didn't solve for 20 or 30 years. And when they solved them 20 or 30 years later, <clears throat> no, the, hold on a second. <clears throat> when they solved them so many years later, the question was, what was the guy doing for the last 20 or 30 years? You, you can't have that kind of a crime. Some of these are such brutal sexual homicides. The guy didn't just go back to his normal life and never kill again. That's just, you know, what, so what's he been doing for 20 or 30 years? And so that's when they start looking to see who else he might have killed off. Um, and you take anybody like the big ones, Green River Killer, Ted Bundy, um, Danny Rawling. And once you catch them, sometimes you go back and you find... They, they've killed quite a few people. And so those were all unsolved crimes for a decade or two. So, but what happens is the police departments at a certain point just sort of bury, a lot of the people got killed. Uh, they bury the crime in the files. Um, they don't, they can't walk around every day talking about it. They don't want to go to, they're not going to run to the media and say, we still haven't got that killer. And they're not going to say, and we have 10 open cases. Now they do sometimes have unsolved cases listed on their websites now. Um, but are they doing anything about it? Maybe not. Maybe they just like, unless we get lucky, we can't, we can't pursue this. Uh, DNA, of course, has made a huge difference. That's why cold cases have been solved because they can go back and find DNA that's still viable and, and it happens to match somebody and they're like, hey, great, we solved that crime. Um, that's, that's usually the way it's done. Um, and now we have CCT, CCTV and cell phones which are making it a lot easier to try to identify killers you know, uh, where, where none of that used to exist. It was much harder to prove anything. Um, so not only did you have no witnesses, but you had no, no phone, uh, phone records. You had no, no, no CCTV videos of a car going down the street or whatever. And then you had, you didn't have good DNA. You couldn't test DNA. So you had maybe blood type, you know, you, you, <laughs> putting that guy away was really tough. You know what I mean? Really, really tough. So unsolved cases, Tons of them across the United States, tons of them across Canada, tons of them. And many, most every country has a ton of unsolved uh, sexual homicides and a bunch of serial killers rolling around. And the, uh, the FBI, I think one point they said there were like 50 serial killers around in the United States. And I just think that's a very low number. I do. I think it's way higher because 50 would be one per state. And I'm going to say when you're looking at Detroit, uh, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., New York City. You, know, you, ain't got, you don't just have one. You know, you're going to have a lot more. And even in a place as small as Ireland in comparison to the United States, where are, all these, where are these serial killers? Now, some may have been arrested. Some may have died. Um, and therefore, uh, but there's still serial killers out there running around. They're not just in the vanishing triangle. Um, that's just one place they could be. Um, let's see. 
Uh, that's that's true. Uh, most people don't deal with the police and have no idea what's going on. That's true. I mean, uh, the, the police world is it's a different kind of world, and it, it it is you know I have to admit you know having dealt with the police outside of the police, <laughs> uh, sometimes they they don't have the best um, they don't have the best methodologies of working with the public. That's why it's always useful to have uh, an intermediary a lot of times. Um, but a lot, the, but then sometimes they have to do what they have to do, and people don't like what they have to do, which is ask questions, uh, and otherwise they can't they can't proceed with the investigation. And if and people don't cooperate, including the family, hard to solve crimes. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> facts are what we you know. Facts are facts are a necessity. You know, it's like guess guesswork doesn't. Mm, isn't isn't so useful um at all um let's see um let's see um uh that's uh this is also good um i don't know what the police do uh when when they do that which is the, the kind of the attitude without explaining themselves, it automatically sets up defensiveness. Yes, it does. Um, a lot of times there's also a lack of ability to explain when you can, why you have to ask the things you have to ask and what, why that has to be done. Like even asking for alibis for the family. People go, well, why would you question us? Well, because we want to put that on record. So that five years from now, somebody doesn't come back and say, where were you? And you don't even know, <laughs> you know, let's get it on record now because it can save you because, and we, sh we should ask alibis of everybody. We want to know everybody is because they may not remember a week from now. Somebody asked me, where was I on Wednesday at five in the afternoon? I think I was here. I think. You know, did I run out to the store? I don't think so. But, you know, I could have, I could be confusing it with Tuesday. And if you ask me a, a year from now, there's just no way I'm going to know where I was. That's just nonsense. Unless I have something very specific, like, oh, look, I put in an order for this food and went and picked it up. You know, it's on my phone. So, you know, you have to explain very clearly. Um, but even then, I will say this. When, when families have asked me to look into cases, and I do, and I explain things very clearly to them. I've had them turn on me and say that I'm, I'm whatever. They have all kinds of things to say about me because if I'm not doing exactly what they want, they get upset that I'm not following the psychics information, or I haven't, I'm not willing to go and interview a hundred people that have nothing to do with the case. Or I even maybe back what the police, uh, I say, well, the police, I think are correct about this. Oh my God, you're just in league with them and you don't, you know, and they're just trying to shove this case under the rug. Um, if I come up with something different than their theory, I, I've had, and it's because they're very emotional. It's, it's, I'm not saying they're bad people. They're just very emotional about the case, and they don't see me that way because they're correct. I'm not. I'm not overly emotional. So they see me as cold-hearted the way they see most police. And it isn't that they're cold-hearted. It's that they have to do the job. And so it's very, it's a very tricky situation. And and also, you know, people go into police work. I mean, that's probably a different group of people that go into, you know, therapy. <laughs> you know, they don't become therapists, become police officers. It's a different kind of personality. Um, I, I, I don't know that I'd make a great therapist. I get annoyed with people who, uh, oh, Patch, what should I do about this? I'm like, I get over it. <laughs> just take care of what you got to take care of. Don't come back here next week with the same. But he still doesn't love me. So he just, because he doesn't love you, go away. <laughs> I'm so mean, but you know, I probably wouldn't be a good therapist. I, I mean, I would be in the sense that I probably could get to people's problems really quickly and they wouldn't spend much money, but then I would have no clients. So, <laughs> um, the list killer on the list killer Reddit, a guy made a map with unsolved deaths that last 20 years. Or Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, if you really work, work at it, you find a whole bunch of uh, crimes you never even realized existed. Even 
I mean, I even see things that happen in my town right now and just even making it in the newspaper. I only know because of because my daughter is connected to the police. Um, but I they didn't even show up in the newspaper, You're like well, or in the media at all. I'm like, what the heck? You know, what did, did that guy just get shot down the block? <laughs> it's like, why have I heard nothing about it? It's very weird. Um uh Let's see. Um, <laughs> oh, no, don't waste your time with them. <laughs> well, they're con good con artists. That's all I can say. Some of them are very good con artists and they do all their research behind everybody's back and then tell them I didn't do any research. And amazingly, though, I know. I have all these pictures of what happened because I did all my research, you know. <laughs> so it's they're just oh yeah, Taylor is that the oh oh no I'm sorry that's a <laughs> I thought my line of work was insane. <laughs> oh my god, it is really it's sort of two very different kinds of fields. Let's put it that way. Um, yes, they're all cons. Sorry, sorry, Anne Maria. If you're a believer in psychics. I apologize, but when I see psychics go after cold cases and families and go take over police stuff or go talk to the dead relatives, it angers me tremendously because they are taking advantage of people who are very, very vulnerable. And I think it's sick and I think it's wrong. And I call that a con artist. Now, if you want to think some psychic can know what's happening in the future, or you can, you know, somehow you can reach the spirit world bully for you. But when you start charging people money and making money off of victims of crimes, I've never seen a psychic do one damn good thing in police work. It's always a waste of time. And it's just, it's on. And if you're going to, if if you're doing that, knowing, and they know full well, it's, it's, it's bull. And that, that's why, why I'm so offended by it. And I've had tons of psychics send me stuff on cases and they've been wrong every single time. The only ones that are halfway good are the ones who are actually profiling. In other words, they're doing their research and they're using logic and they're saying, this is where I think the body is. or the And it's just logic. It has nothing to do with psychic world. So I'm sorry. I'm definitely not. I'm, I'm very, very anti-psychics, extremely so. Uh, again, uh, if we disagree on that, it's okay. Um, I, I don't dislike you because you believe in them. And I hope you don't dislike me because I absolutely despise them. <laughs> and if you are one, what can I say? <laughs> as long as you stay away from victims of crimes and you do this in your own time, in your own little world, uh, you know, maybe I, you know something I don't. But when, it, when, when anybody interferes with the victims of crimes and police work, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm just done. I am. <laughs> oh, my God. So anyway, <laughs> not that I have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I can't lie about that because there's just there's a few things that I just can't go for. And that's one of them. Um, and I've seen just too much damage, so much damage, so many people being played. Absolutely. And the, and the, the guy that I pointed out last week, was it Taylor? Was it his name Taylor? The, 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 new, the new psychic on the block. I mean, he's good at what he does. He's a great con artist. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a great con artist. But those all those hollywood psychics and all that kind of bull crap it's all bull they're all they're all they're, all, they're great con artists they know what they're doing and they know how to do it well and um it's, you know I, it, and part of me says hey if you're willing to fall for that stuff maybe you should just get taken for the ride but i i still it's a lie and and it's being set up as a lie too um they know do, darn well what they're doing and it's not psychic stuff it's 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 um clever cold case reading and clever manipulation and and clever stuff um and that's what they've always been so so anyway i hope you don't hate me but there we go <laughs> i just uh, say that's the one thing that puts me over the edge um well i got a few things to put me over the edge but that's just that's just one of my big ones um that i've never cotton to shall we say just because i don't like liars you know I've, I've always had a thing about the truth i do not like liars and as a profiler what's interesting to me i've said it before people will believe a psychic before that believe me because i don't know something 
that cannot be explained how I know it. And as a profile, as a matter of fact, what's also very interesting is that some of the FBI profilers who pretend that they know things simply because they can meld minds with the serial killers and they almost act like they're psychics, like, I know it's a married guy with two children and a wife and a dog and a van. How do you know this? So you're, you're acting like a psychic because unless you can tell the, absolutely explain why that is true in that particular case, in that particular crime, what all I can say is I would believe the guy had a car. <laughs> why? because he's in the middle of nowhere. He's got to have some way to take her someplace. Most likely a car, unless he ha unless his guy's got a house right next door to the bar or something. Um, I would look at each crime and I have to be able to support what I say and not do psychic work or guesswork. Um, but what happens with, um, now people are so highly, highly impressed a lot of times with the, with the, the profiler who says, those kind of things. Well, you know, he has trouble with women and he, um, he probably, he had likely has a, a high school education and he blah, blah, blah. And they give this whole long diatribe based on absolutely nothing. And people go, Oh my God, he's so brilliant. He's able to get, he's able to uh, give us a whole picture of the serial killer. No, he's not. He's making up stuff and you're falling for it. He's, he's conning you. If that's the way he's doing his profile and he's conning you and the same thing is true for a psychic, they're conning you. But the problem is both of these seem to have some special ability beyond normal, beyond normal, some amazing ability, a psychic because they can reach the spirit world, a profiler because he can somehow meld minds with a serial killer because he's been around serial killers. He knows. No, he doesn't. And I don't play that game. I tell you exactly why I think what I think. And I support it with evidence. And but people will believe either of these two people before they'll ever believe me because I'm not, I'm taking away the magic. They want to believe in magic, not in reality. And so yeah, they'll they'll go for those two first. And it is frustrating sometimes because I'm like, why are you believing that? You know, where are you getting that from? Why is where is that coming from? And then they get mad at me because I don't want to go along with the program. And I say, I'm sorry, I, uh, I don't see any evidence. I go with cold, hard facts. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, Jill says, profiling isn't about knowing who did it. It's about looking at the available evidence and identifying what to look for, isn't it? Correct. Um, there, you know, these three, these three situations right here, the guys who committed this crime may be very similar, extremely similar. I can tell you, I can tell you something. The guy's a psychopath <laughs> and I'm not pulling that out of nowhere. I'm saying that if you have a person who kidnaps a stranger for the purposes of rape and murder, you have a psychopath. And that's true for every single serial killer. Every single one is a psychopath. Um, other than that, can I tell you if the guy who did this was kidnapped these women was 20, 30, 40, 50? No, I can't. Um, I can't tell you if he's married or isn't. That's nonsense. How would I know? Because, because what? I don't know where, where you, where you get that. Now she was seen put, being put into a boot of a car. So the guy owns a vehicle. Now, because he owns a vehicle doesn't mean he's employed. That could be his wife's vehicle. That could be his mommy's vehicle. That could be a vehicle he stole. It could be a vehicle he bought for a thousand bucks and uh, and it's been, you know, it still manages to get around. He could have borrowed a friend's car. <laughs> I, just, I can't make up something about where the car came from. All I can say is there was a vehicle involved. I mean, probably all of us could figure that out. That's not, that's not any kind of profiling brilliance on that, on that. Um, and then when you find the person, if you find the body and you can see how the person killed them, there are certain things you might be able to determine from the method of, method of killing uh, that might be some clues of some things. Um, but, you know, usually when you're looking at a crime, you're looking at all kinds of information, putting all that information together. But none of it should be statistics and none of it should be plain up guesswork. And every single element that you speak about 
there should be a, a, a clarification as to how you arrived at that particular piece of information. So some FBI agent said it's a married guy with two kids and a wife. I want to know where you got that crap from. Because that's nonsense. I mean, and yes, there were these other guys that got caught, did have a wife and two kids, <laughs> but it wasn't those guys. So is every guy with a wife and two kids is, is a serial killer? I mean, is there nobody out there who kills without wife and two kids? Of course. And I've seen some pretty, um, some pretty fancy crimes done by guys who live all alone. Uh, so, some very careful fellows who are not married. Um, then I've seen ones where I think it was the Baton Rouge serial killer where the, the police said the guy was white. Um, he was white um, and he had, he had trouble uh, in relationship with the women and he, was an, he wasn't very social because supposedly the methodology of kill, killing. Turned out the guy was black, married and gave, gave, um, and gave barbecues for the neighborhood. <laughs> It was like nowhere near the profile. You don't you don't see the FBI running around bragging about that profile because they guessed that crap and it had nothing to do with the absolute evidence whatsoever. And so, yeah. And if you're going to go a certain direction and you, you, you might want to be clear about why you're going to why you why you say this is this is a good way to look for whatever reasons um, that. You know, if you if you, if guys got a car seat and the, the kidnapper had a car seat in the car, you might want to look for a guy who's got a kid. <laughs> Sometimes, how far the car, how the seat, if a car a car is found, let's say a guy kidnaps a, a woman, and the car seat is pulled, you know, pulled back because he's got longer legs than her. You want that's a, that's an that's an actual information. Um, and there's other things. There's there's different kinds of pieces of information when you can piece them all together. You can sometimes come up with a pretty good portrait. But the question is, how much do you have and where, where are you jumping to conclusions? Um, and, you know, so you come up with what is useful to the investigation as far as looking for somebody, but you don't want to completely overlook somebody else. Um, like, for example, uh, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the Maryland case of Rachel Morin, now the DNA matched a guy out in, in L.A. and they said he was Hispanic. Now, the, now, they said he was Hispanic. My question immediately was, how do they know he's Hispanic? Uh, and the only way I think that they could know he was Hispanic is if the people in the house that he had inv did the home invasion heard him speaking Spanish, for example. <laughs> Something that would tell them. Uh, did, did, I mean, you could say by looks, maybe they recognize his looks match a certain particular location in the world. But from his back, which is all we saw um, uh, on a video, personally, I couldn't tell if he was Hispanic or if he was, uh, depending on his height, whether he was, uh, could have been from the Middle East, he could have been Pakistani, he could have been, you know, he could have been a biracial white black combo from the U.S. I mean, who, I mean, I gotta have some information why the heck the dude's Hispanic, you know? Um, so it, that's, you know, these are the kind of things you gotta be careful, but I say, where did you get the information from? I assume they got it from the people in the house, some very specific thing that said he was Hispanic. But I wish they had said that because the people out there, should they be looking for only a, only a Hispanic guy or should they be looking for other guys who might look that way? Uh, you know, uh, because some people could look similar and be from another an, uh, another background, another country, you know, it's, you know assuming that they go, oh, he's Mexican. Well, how do you know he's Mexican? He could be El Salvadorian. He could be, he could be Venezuelan, you know. Why would you say that? You got to come up with something. So important to have information. Um, uh, well, I, I certainly know that's true for... Um, <laughs> for, for for Ireland, and that's a huge problem. Um, <laughs> taco residue in the car. <laughs> well, there's something to that. So, but to, see, then you get some interesting. You get some interesting issues. I joked about the um, the the guy down in the Georgia case because he got he got arrested for uh, shoplifting queso fresco, uh, which is a is a Mexican cheese. Um, and so you know other countries use it too. And he's he's not Mexican. He is um. 
uh, Venezuelan. Uh, but I also use queso fresco. So, you know, let's say you come to my car and you find in my car. Now, for example, since I spend a lot of time with the Indian stuff, um, I go to Indian, I go to Indian uh, grocery stores. And some of the things I, you might find in my, my, my car, uh, some Indian things that are very not stuff Americans would buy. I mean, Americans buy butter chicken and that, that's it. Oh, butter chicken. But they go in my car and they find stuff that, hey, that looks like an Indian person because that stuff is very Indian-like. Uh, only Indian people would know. Then they might click on my thing and they might come up with a, a Bollywood Indian music and they'd say, well, clearly an Indian person did this crime. <laughs> they wouldn't be looking for me. It's like, hey, I know how to get away with things. you know. <laughs> but on the other hand, if they did come up with it was a Mazda and there were 10 Mazdas in the area and turns out that nine of the Mazdas have belonged to other people and I'm the 10th one and they come into my house and find Indian food and Indian music. I'm doomed, you know? So, you know, <laughs> oh my God. Um, uh, the mentalist, I'm trying to let, did I, the mentalist was um, amusing. Um, I like some of it. Some of it was crazy, uh, but yeah, <laughs> that was one of the shows I could tolerate more than others. I, I always point out the best profiling show is Psych. Psych actually does a really good profiling job. <laughs> Even though he's pretending to be psychic, he's actually profiling. And he's doing it deductive style of profiling where he's looking at the evidence. Uh, and uh, of course, um, Death in Paradise is using a uh, deductive profiling method. So I appreciate that even if the crimes are absolutely ridiculous and no criminal actually commits crimes like that, but at least they're using deductive methodologies uh, and not doing the stupid uh, criminal minds bull crap, which just drives me over the edge. So <laughs> go Bengals, yeah, I got those too. <laughs> and I have sorries. <laughs> oh my gosh, um, I sure do. Let me just see something. I just wanna see if I can find anything. Oh. Um, I uh, just wanted to see if there was another p interesting thing that she had written that I just thought was um, quite fascinating. Um, just to check here. Uh, oh, this there literally was just way too much, and I couldn't get possibly get that into it in in a show. Uh, just just too difficult. Um, that's why I do recommend uh, reading her book, which I just think it was really quite fascinating. Um, yeah, this she says here, instead of finding one obvious red flag suspect, I was finding several. It was starting to feel as if violent murder as well as rape of women in Ireland was not as unusual as I thought. And that is absolutely true. And so she starts doing this book and she is probably going to come up with, am I going to figure out who the guy is, who, the, the serial killer? Now, I can't come up with that either because there's no evidence. <laughs> you know, you can't work with it. And we're finding out, as she pointed out, all these other crimes which are very similar crimes. It's just qu quite amazing um, how many were, you know, uh, here's another one. Um, uh, who's Eve? Um, mm, uh, she's got, she's, she's literally got a ton. Uh, she's got a ton of different cases uh, in here. It's just a fascinating book. I'm just going to say, read that book. I can't go through the whole book, but it's just, and then she says, oh, here's something she said. I thought was interesting. Um, said this, uh, it was clear from my research and talking to a guy named Pat Murray that Ciara Breen's disappearance, and that was um, a different one. Um, that's that, that was, uh, she was in this, I think she was in this group. Is she in this group? Yeah. Oh, yeah, see, I don't know how it's pronounced, Ciara or Ciara. Um, her disappearance was not actually a mystery. It's just never been officially solved. I asked him about it. It was fairly obvious, he said, who killed her. So this is, the, so this is when you had the vanishing here. Yeah, her body's vanished, but they know who killed her. Um, and he wasn't in the frame of any of the other cases. It, it was possibly a mistake to include her in what's called Operation Trace, which was the vanishing of these women, uh, the cold case review. And the, she, 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 was it wrong to include her? And he said, yeah, it really was. It clouded the waters and wasted time, took the focus from the real killer, whoever that was. And she said, for me, this was a new way of looking at the triangle cases. I've been building up the impression that the, the Gardi have been negligent in not linking the cases sooner, but maybe they weren't linked, all linked after all. Exactly. We absolutely do not know. These three cases, 
these three cases apparently are three different people and they believe they know who they are and they just can't come up with the evidence to prove it. And then we have the three, three cases and it's, are they linked? Don't know. And are these three linked to each other or is this one linked to that one guy and maybe she's linked to another guy and maybe she's linked to a third guy. They may be linked to other cases, but not necessarily within that triangle. So, so it says a lot of that is very misleading. Uh, then she said, maybe I've been too harsh on the police. Maybe there are reasons not to link the cases for a start. People disappear a lot more often than we realize. And that's absolutely true. In the UK, something like 1000 people are reported missing every day. Most of them will quickly be found around 99% within a year. But that still is a significant number who can't be located. But you see how many, what are you going to do? They're not all linked. They don't even, dis they're not even actually mysteries. They just run away and then they come back. Um, and it says, and she says this, uh, another place, most murderers have no idea they're going to kill and no plan for what to do afterwards when they suddenly have a body on their hands. She's calling those impulse crimes. Um, I think we're talking about people going into rages and killing somebody they know, uh, as opposed to a serial killer who, who always has a plan to kill. Now, a serial killer may not plan to do it that day. But he, he may always be out there uh, doing reconnaissance, trolling, looking for an opportunity, and that day presents. But I think she's talking about things where, you know, people just, uh, in, the, in the other cases, they get angry, they're out for the boyfriend, they get in a fight, he kills her. And, and she says here, and therefore they're hard to cover up, except these three. Well, they think, believe they know who did it, but they've covered up their bodies so well that they can't charge them. Um, so she says there's blood, fingerprints, fiber evidence, and nowadays phone records in a digital trail as well. In these triangle cases, the fact that no bodies have been found suggests someone organized, not necessarily. See that, that organized thing is not necessarily true. Um, Someone who went who went out ready to kill that day, not necessarily true. Again, serial killers sometimes just see an opportunity and, and grab it. And the, the problem is when you're talking about isolated areas, once you disable the person that is with you. Now she could have gone to the meet this, met this guy, gone into the bar, had some drinks, and left. And and she he says, I'll give you a ride back to your, your house. She gets in the car with him and that's it. He didn't necessarily start that day by saying, hey, I'm going to kill her. And if and maybe if he was in the bar and somebody said, hey, Joe, she'd be alive. Why? Because he, if he was recognized by somebody, he might not want to take that chance. Let's say they were driving out of the parking lot and uh, the police stopped them to say, hey, um, we're, we're, you know, did, you, did we have a lost dog? She may have come home alive. Why? Because his opportunity disappeared. But if he gets her in the car and nobody recognized him in the place, he's like, and they're halfway home, he's like, hmm, I think I'll just pull off down this road. He might decide just then to do that. Um, or somebody, he might be driving along and see that girl by herself hitching a ride and said, well, I wasn't planning on raping anybody this evening, but I'm not going to turn down a good deal. And he grabs her and throws her, you know, she gets in the car and that's that. So a lot of times it isn't planned that well. And if you have bogs everywhere, which it seems like Ireland just has the best getting rid of body ground I've ever seen. Um, you know, if you're, uh, if you're especially, especially if you're a single person, not necessarily always married, but let's say you're a single person. You've gone to work. You went out. You had a few drinks with your friends. You don't have to be home at any particular time. You leave the bar. You're driving down the road. You pick up a girl. And you take her and, you know, 20 minutes later, you've raped her and murdered her. Well, okay, so you take an hour driving down some back roads till you find a good bog to dump her in. You do that and then you go home. You don't have to be highly organized to do that. Um, so that's, that organized thing is a little bit of a overkill that the FBI has always like to say anybody who doesn't hit a person over the head and leave their body right where, where they fall is somehow organized. Um, I'm not very fond of that particular term. Um, and then she said also, it's perhaps two people working together. And that's true. You never know if some, one of these cases have more than one person involved. Of the women who are murdered in the same area, whose cases are possibly linked, 
Many were found buried deep in the bog, far from the road, which suggests you might need more than one person to carry them there. Uh, possibly. Or you got a strong dude. <laughs> I don't know. Um, joint murderers are possible. Um, I wondered what kind of person would know how to hide a body so well and to avoid leaving any other evidence. Would he be able to take a woman off the street sometimes in the middle of the day without ever being seen? Someone who has done it before. Well, all you need is an opportunity. And the thing is also that happens is you get a guy like the guy who put the woman in the boot and was seen doing it. Was he a guy who'd never done it before? Or was he a guy who got sloppy? And just because, so, so you got a guy who take, uh, okay, so she's grabbed, put in the boot of the car and the guy disappears with her. Is he organized because he didn't get caught putting her in the boot of the car and the other guy wasn't organized when he got caught putting her in the boot of the car? You see, this is, um, you can speculate all you want on that, but I don't think it serves a lot of purpose. Um, you can't really tell how good a guy is at something on, on as far as that goes. I, I don't see anything particularly brilliant about the only thing you have to be careful of is not to leave, get blood in your car. That's, that's, that's kind of not a good idea, but if nobody knows it's your car, if the person vanishes, disappears and the body's not found, you've got so much time to work with. They may never come knocking, in which case it doesn't matter how bad your car is messed up. Uh, but if you have time to clean out the boot of your car or whatever else you got to do to clean up your car, um, even crush it, take it someplace and get it crushed, uh, whatever, you know, if they never come after you, it's not an issue. So there's a lot of crimes which are committed where fibers are there and blood is there and everything else. But the, 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 the link to the guy is not there. So therefore that evidence just doesn't exist uh, for the police. Uh, now, if evidence is found on the body, that's, that's a little bit more useful. If they find a body, don't find a body don't have that evidence. So, um, and then she talks about um, uh, the DNA testing wasn't available to the mid nineties. And even then Ireland lagged behind and the availability of testing facilities. So that is a problem. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, more recent cases in Ireland been solved by DNA technology or both. And that's, that has improved things greatly. That is for sure. Um, so she's learned, she has learned a lot um, about how things actually work. And that's why I think it's, it's quite, quite fascinating um, that she came in kind of with a negative attitude toward the police thinking, well, they should have linked these together. Why didn't they find the guy? Blah, blah, blah. It's one serial killer, clearly. <laughs> and now she's found out that none of that was necessarily true. And that's why I like her, her book over the, the movie or the documentary, because I think she's, she's learned a lot along the way and she's discussing what she's learned. Um, and I think that makes this book very, very interesting. So I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, so it's in the link below. It will be <laughs> when this goes public anyway. Um, what? Uh, a good defense. What's a good defense? Um, oh, um, yes, I'm gonna, I wanna comment on this. Taylor, I have a siren on my keychain. It's obnoxiously loud if I pull the string on it. I've never had to use it, but I wonder if it would scare off a creep. And, um, and Harper says in return, she says, I think it'd be a very good defense. They would get scared and leave. Okay. People have asked me, what should a woman take with her? Pepper spray, uh, what? I've always said, take the siren alarm. Why? Because pepper spray is hard to use and you got to aim it just right. And so, you know, if you don't aim it right, you're dead. Um, Self-defense classes are worthless, uh, mostly because you're a, a lightweight fighting Mike Tyson. You know, the, the size of a guy compared to the woman is, and his strength level is way over a woman. And unless you study and are, are totally a black belt and you have an opportunity to actually not get hit over the back of the head, because most of the time by the, you know, the guy could jumps out, you know, if the guy's coming towards you, all right, if the guy's coming towards you, if you had a gun on you, you could shoot him. That would work. <laughs> you got to make sure the guy's in front of you. Um, 
uh, if you're going to try to use, um, if the guy's coming towards you and you're a black belt, you might have a chance. Most women are not going to succeed. That's why there's weight classes in boxing and, 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 and any, any of these things is weight classes. Because when you throw a punch, unless that guy's unconscious, when you finish throwing that punch, the next punch is coming right back at you and you're going to be unconscious. So your chances are really crappy. Um, and all those silly self-defense things I tell you, you know, do this, kick this way, but yeah, you know, he's just going to break your neck. That's all. <laughs> You're probably going to lose unless you've studied it. I mean, really studied it as a martial artist, but these one day classes, three day classes are all nonsense. All they do is encourage women and say, Oh, now you know how to do these techniques. And now you should go out to a bar drinking and you walk out of the bar half drunk on high heels and you're going to use your techniques. No, you're not. But the siren, the siren is really good because the whole thing, scream fire, stuff, dumb stuff like that. No, the siren is good because it does two things. One, it's really loud. Like you say, Taylor, it's really loud. And the guy doesn't want attention drawn to the person he's trying to attack. And when you pull that thing, you can chuck it in or whatever. There's, there's ways, to, there's different methods where they uh, keep, keep me going. He's got no way to shut it off. He He's going to get the hell out of there. He's not, it's not worth trying to attack you when the siren is going and people might run and find out what's going on. Secondly, it hurts the ears. So it's not fun to rape when your ears hurt. So it's just not pleasant. So he probably would just run away. So I think the siren thing is the one of the simplest, best things you can possibly have um, and not, not need any talent, uh, not need a, you know, a carry license and all of that. Um, so I think that's very useful. Now, again, you have to, the only way you're going to be able to set that thing off is if you don't get hit over the back of the head, in which case it's too late. So you have to be very aware of your, your surroundings. And as I tell people all the time, I don't care, even if you have a gun, uh, if you're not, if that gun isn't ready to use and you'd see the guy that you're you know, pointing it out, um, you, you, you know, you, you're not going to, you're not going to survive it. Uh, so you, the problem is you don't want to get overly confident. You always want to look at something as a risk factor. So you're coming out of a store by yourself, walking down a row of cars, uh, and nobody else is out there, at, and it's night. You are putting yourself in a situation where, no, nobody is hiding under your car and going to grab your foot. Don't, don't go for that dumb stuff. But somebody might be sitting in a vehicle near your vehicle. And as you're coming by to go your vehicle, that guy jumps out of his vehicle and grabs you. That can happen. Um, he can block your vehicle in. He can, there's all kinds of things that could happen. He can hit you with his vehicle and then and then grab you. Um, so, you know, and, and even if you're walking through the park, to your car and you see people out there, the question is, who are you seeing out there? Um, obviously, it's just a mom and dad and couple, three little children. You're probably safe. But you see some guy walking to his car. You don't always see safe, or is he not safe? So it's it's the trouble is it's isolation. You if you're there, and and the killer is there, you're in trouble. I call it the, I call it a triangle. So you have you have the the psychopath here, you have you over here, and then you have this, and that's the opportunity. And you know you could you could walk down. You could be over here. You could be walking down a uh, you could be walking down um, a trail a, a trail in the dark. You could be walking down a bike path in the dark for three hours, and and you could rot. And you could, there could be all the opportunity in the world, but nothing happens to you. Why? Because the psychopath wasn't there. Or the psychopath can be there. He's on the he he has he you know, but you're not there. So then the, the opportunity doesn't present itself. But you get that triangle. You're there, you're walking down the trail, the killer is there, and nobody else is there. Boom, opportunity. And it's like the fire triangle, but it's it's a it's how unsafe that is. So coming out of bars into the dark, um, you know, sometimes living alone is unfortunately a problem. Hitchhiking is a problem, prostitution is a problem, drugs are a problem. Any place that you can get isolated doing whatever you're doing, and it may be nothing terrible, maybe just walking home from work, for God's sakes. Um, that's simple. Uh, you're alone with a guy that you hardly know. You're going on a date with a guy. He, he tells you what his name is, but it really isn't. <laughs> you know, you found him on some dating site and he says, hey, let's meet up. 
but instead of meeting at the coffee shop, or maybe you do meet at some place and, and, you know, you say, oh, you know, we're going to meet there. And then you don't even get in there. He just grabs you in the parking lot or you do meet and then you walk out and he kills you. You know, you don't know who he is. You know, and I, I'm, I'm not very fond of, you know, the concept of going out with people. You have no idea who they are. Um, I go for the old fashioned method where you get to know the person through work or through hobbies or whatever. So you actually, people know who that person is. You know who that person is. It's not a complete stranger, um, but you know, opportunity that's that's what they need and if you're there when that the killer is there and nobody else is witnesses 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 but yeah that the, the siren thing is the best thing i can think of that you could you know that you can do uh that's probably doable but you got to see the person before you can pull the thing <laughs> don't get hit over the back of the head <laughs> um uh Walking, um, I'm not sure which one this is. Walking home from work in broad daylight. Yeah, yep. Uh, you know, um, not to be alone. Basically, that's it. I mean, it, not to be alone. The thing is, and, and it, you know, this she goes into the book. In the book, she's very upset about that. That why don't women have the right to live a free and happy life? Well, gosh, don't I wish. Um, <laughs> you know. Uh, she said that when she was growing up in Ireland, one of the problems was getting shot because of the, the ongoing war stuff there. She said you were more likely to be shot by a soldier and, or something some exploding thing going off. You didn't think about serial killers because you had different kinds of risks um, involved. Um, anybody who lives in, in a country that has minefields, I mean, you know, you could be happily, you know, skipping to school one day and you step on a mine, and pff, you know, um, but life is not risk-free for male or female, but of course, females seem to have the bad end of the stick on that. Well, men get men get to be sent to war and get killed off. You know that that's you know. I mean, right now you don't want to be in certain countries um, right now as a male because you probably aren't going to live long. Um, but females, uh, unfortunately, because of our size, um, we we do end up being victims of men way more than we wish we were. And uh, so yeah, so. So it's, it's just a matter of you just to analyzing the risk level of anything you do um, and trying to stay with, you know, obviously when you're with other people, you're usually safer uh, because you have witnesses um, and being with people, you have a strong uh, belief that they're safe people because you have reason to, to believe that uh, not just because you make it up in your head. Um, when, when it's like leaving your children, who do you leave your children with? Well, I always say, well, when I, my kids were little, I would left my children with my mother. She was on my safe list. And there were other people I liked very much. But I would leave my kids with them because <laughs> I had to analyze the risk level. It's like, yeah, you're nice, but you got some shady boyfriends. You know, my kids are not going to your house. So, you know, or going to somebody else's house. Um, I had a friend who I, I hadn't seen in years. And I, I made sure that I, I, she said, look, why don't you come on over? We can hang out. I'm like, I don't know who she hooks up with because she was always a little uh, on the wild side. I said, how about we meet at a restaurant? And we did. We met at a restaurant, had a lovely dinner. I drove to my car there. I drove my car home because I didn't know if I went to her house, it would be some kind of drug bust over there or something, you know, and I'd be sitting there and they'd say, well, Pat Brown was caught in a drug bust. And I'd say, well, you know, I, I, I just, you know, it's an old friend. I just went to see her. Well, why did you go to her house when you didn't, when you already knew she was kind of sketchy? You know, don't go there. You didn't have total faith. Now I have friends I have total faith in, and yes, I'll go to their house. But, you know, got to analyze your risk level um, and just accept that's a reality. And, yeah, there's some things we don't get to do because it's too risky and it sucks. So, yeah, Rachel Moran found out, and so did uh, Lakin. Both of those women lost their lives not doing something wrong, doing something perfectly fine but in a location which made them uh, e an easy target for a psychopath. And unfortunately for both of them, the psychopath showed up. they really, you know, very unfortunate uh, for them. Just, and you know, the, the one thing, oh, before I go, I'll just point out one of the things she said, and, and which is, it's funny she mentioned it. She, she mentioned Sliding Doors, the movie Sliding Doors. I don't know if you've ever seen Sliding Doors, but it's a great movie and and in it, I forgot who was in it. Famous, famous somebody. Anyway, <laughs> she goes, she she's running to catch the, the subway or the, uh, the tube. I don't know. I think it might be the tube. Is it? 
I think it was in England. I'm not sure. Anyway, she's running to catch it. And there, and what happens is there's a division in time. And in one side, she catches it. And the other one, the, clo the door is closed before she's able to get on. So she has to wait for the next one. And depending on whether she arrives home exactly when she did, if she caught it, or whether she arrived home 15, 20 minutes later, changed the whole course of her life. And they show both of her lives as if she caught that one and if she missed it. And it's very interesting because that's sometimes what happens in these situations where if, if she hadn't caught, uh, maybe uh, if she had caught a different ride, if one, if a, if a nice person had pulled up just before the bad guy and she got in the nice person car, she would have been home and had a rest of her life to live. She gets grabbed right outside her house. What if she just stayed in the store an extra or in the bank? She was there just a little bit longer. What if there had just been somebody walking next to her as she was going down the block, going into her house? She would have walked in the house and never had a clue that she was that close to being abducted and murdered. And she would have gone on and lived the rest of her life. So, you know, sometimes it's just that that moment in time, the opportunity, and that's that's what uh, predators they go for opportunity, but it their opportunity isn't always, they don't care if it's you or if it's your friend or if it's another person. They don't care. It's just whoever came into that spot when that opportunity arose and, you know, and fit their bill. You know, I mean, obviously if it's a, you know, 200 pound guy, probably they wouldn't grab him <laughs> and throw him in the boot of their car, you know, but if, it, if that opportunity to present itself and at that moment, any woman who was a reason, any any one of these women he would have taken, you know, why not? So it isn't, you're not being picked out as a victim personally. He's just picking out somebody who was available. But that's why I have to try not to be available. But in her case, Mike, she didn't do anything. I mean, she was just going into her house, for God's sake, snatched right out the street. I mean, she did, her risk level was very low. And so sometimes even when you don't do anything that's even this hardly the slightest bit risky, you can still be a victim. Now, she did something risky. She was hitchhiking. She, we still don't quite know what the heck happened to her, whether she it was that guy or not. I don't know. But she was unfortunately running around alone or at least with somebody she didn't know or took a ride from somebody she didn't know. I don't know how it all worked out. But so but she snatched straight off the street. I mean, and, and the uh, other woman I was talking about, the cousin of Murphy, who attacked the woman in the park, theoretically, she could have gone home a different way uh, with a vehicle. And she chose to walk through the park, thinking it was probably just a shortcut to her house, and she wasn't thinking about it. But it was dark, and, a sh and it was a park. So she did put herself in a riskier situation. So, yeah, it's very unfortunate, very unfortunate. Um Ted Bundy was cruising for victims for hours until it worked. Yeah, I mean, you have to understand that um, serial killers, a lot of them don't have very interesting lives. Their, their interest is in the crimes they commit. So some of them who are really gung-ho for it, that, that's what they do. You know, just like guys go online and troll for hours and hours and hours, uh, you know, hooking up with girls online. Uh, and there are hundreds of them. Because they spend all the time sitting, you know, in their basement. That's what they do all day long. They don't have anything else that they do. So, yeah, they can they can put a lot of effort into it. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, witnesses, 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 as best as best you can accomplish. So, yeah, I, there's, a, there's a lake I, I go around, and it, but that's a heavily trafficked lake uh, as far as the people walking around it. There's people fishing there, and, but it's not, there's no real empty spots on the lake where you can suddenly get pulled into the bushes. All of it is visible all the way around. So it's one of the safest, it's a small, it's called a pond. And so, but it's, it's a small lake, but that's pretty safe. But I've been on other places. I went on, so I went on a walk one day and it was right. It was next to the road. This, this whole path went on for like, I don't know, two miles, three miles next to the road. Only I didn't know that at one point, it veered off the road, went into the woods, went into a tunnel that went over the highway. It was like a, like a, you know, it was more like a tunnel going over the highway and then more woods. It was suddenly creepy as heck. And I, and I'm like, what do I do? 
You know, do I just turn around and go back? Should I keep going? I did keep going. And then I thought maybe I shouldn't have kept going because I was isolated on that whole stretch. Um, and you could see for quite a while if there was a person there or not. I um, mean, so, so a predator can be coming along and he can look, he can see a woman coming and he can look past the woman and see there's nobody coming after her, look behind him, see there's nobody behind him. And that's his moment of opportunity. So yeah, just, just, just <laughs> it's frustrating. It really is as a female, it's very frustrating. Um, no, not a good thing. So um, yeah, that, that's true. That That is also true, you know? You know, my, my uh, daughter actually was uh, returning from Ocean City, Maryland, back to where we live on the other side of the, the Bay Bridge. And um, they got a little bit of a late start because um, they were trying to get everything put together. And they got there. And right before they reached the bridge, there was that, what, 30 car pileup on the bridge. And uh, they missed it by just that little bit, you know. So they're just like, oh, thank God I stopped to finish the laundry, <laughs> you know. But that's that's life. I mean, you know, you never know whether you, whether you. Um, I always I always remember the uh, there was a movie about 9/11, but from Bollywood, Indian Bollywood movie, and all the people were getting on the plane, and all the people in the movie got to know them all, and they all made the planes. They were it's, it's very fictionalized, but they all got on the planes, and they were on the different ones, and and they all they all died except for this one girl who missed the plane and she was so upset that she had missed the plane because she was on her way to get married and she's trying to get where she was going and she missed the plane. She's the only one of the whole char bunch of characters who survived. So, you know, <laughs> sometimes it pays to be late. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure I might be doomed. I, I do have some martial arts skills, but as I say, it has to be a small enough guy, you know, I have to be a little guy who I have to surprise him. You've only got one chance. That's the thing. You know, when you're dealing with most, you know, if I was a guy grabs my arm someplace, I got literally one chance. And then I have to run like hell and I have to hope there's someplace to run to. Because, and, you know, unless I was carrying, uh, carrying a weapon uh, and could pull it and shoot him, you know. <laughs> so, But if I'm just using my fist, I better, I better hit him straight in the nose and hard enough that he just doesn't get annoyed. And then... <laughs> And then beat me to death, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, what what was this? What what was the movie on this? Which one? The Sliding Doors is the the that's that's the great that's that good movie and the the, the Bollywood movie. Ah, I don't remember that. I could put a uh, Bollywood nine eleven film. I, mean, I think it's a great film. It's just it's it's really heart rending. It's just a really good film. I loved it, um, but you know most people aren't Bollywood fans, so you know. Uh, but I am, and a 9/11 movie. Let's see if it come up with a 9/11 movie. Uh, no, there's a whole bunch of them. <laughs> films based on the 9/11 attacks. Yeah. Uh, um, oh, here we go. Six must-watch. There's six six films. Hmm. What are they? Um, let's see. It's not that one. It's not that one. It's not that one. Oh, oh yeah, that's it. Um, um, in English, I think it's uh, Yon Hota to Kaya Hota. <laughs> I can't. Uh, Yon Hota to Kaya Hota. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but it's really it's really a beautiful movie. I, I really love that movie. Um, it's just, yeah, I liked it a lot. But anyway, that's it, guys. I got I got to go. This, as I say, was a little bit of a confusing show, and I do apologize for that. Um, and it was because it was so hard to um, try to explain what this whole thing with the vanishing triangle was and what any of it had any meaning. Um, it's because of the complications of understanding how many different people were out there who were actually killed outside the triangle and whether any of them had anything to do with anything. So it's not like I have a case I can simply analyze and say, that's what happened because okay. I don't know. Um, uh, but I did want to compare some of the concepts of, of what all of this meant. Um, and 
Uh, I say it's, I knew it was going to be a bit confusing, and I, my pictures were just too small again. Couldn't find the damn things. Uh, and her, I had so many. I had I had actually copied so many notes from her, her, uh, her book that was just you know it just was so overwhelming because there's so much to, to pay attention to, and and it's really hard to do in in a show like this. Um, let me see. Let me just see if there's um, just for the sake of it. Um, Where'd that go? Uh, uh, this is what happens when you get over, overwhelmed with stuff, man. Right? Um, let's see. I want to see what that, that's here. Um, oh, and then she pointed out a couple of things. I'll point a couple more things. In, uh, indifference can be, can be fatal. Until we treat every case, every unsolved murder, and every suspicious disappearance as equally important, we can't hope to build up a true picture of what killers are doing. That's how they get away with it. But she's also, it's also un, unlikely that you can do that. That's that's the problem. That's that's your utopia version of things. And I think that was probably in the beginning <laughs> of her life. Uh, I mean, her book that she was thinking that way. Um, and then she, she talks about this that when a woman goes missing, judgments are often made about her past life and sexual history. The focus of the investigation would often begin with the idea she'd gone off with a man not, and not consider that perhaps she'd been taking against her will. As police in America or England? No, no I think every it's the same thing. The problem is majority of people are not being kidnapped. And this is the problem, again, of the many, many missing people who return. If the majority of people aren't being kidnapped, you cannot jump to the most unlikely possibility first, because especially when people are involved in prostitution or drugs or, you know, whatever they're involved in, they're, they're excessively drinking or whatever. You never know if they're just going to go off with somebody and you're sitting there and you're putting, you put in a ton of money. Remember, every time you put in money and manpower to go over here, that means you took it from someplace else. It's not like it's a... It's an even deal. Every single case gets a justice amount of money. No, you've only got so much money and so much time, and you cannot chase down things that are unlikely to actually be crimes because then you can't deal with the actual thing that is a crime. Uh, and so you have to make decisions, even if they're not pleasant ones. So if you get a woman, for example, and you say, uh, well, yeah, the Asuka family, has she run away before? family lies to you, <laughs> but then you find out that she's run away twice. And when she ran away the first time, she didn't come back for 36 hours. She ran away the second time she was gone a week. And now she's been gone for 24 hours and the family's saying, you got to go find her. Well, but she ran away twice before. Are we going to put in all this effort? And then she just wanders in one, uh, a few days later, she just wanders in and goes, yeah, I was with my boyfriend, my new boyfriend. I never told you about him. But could she have been kidnapped? Well, of course. If she's if she's doing things like running away from home, she's putting herself at a high risk. But what do you do? What do you do when it comes down to where do you put your effort? You only have so much time and money. And you know, you have to put it where you think it is going to be used most wisely. So much as people would love it to be true that you should take do all these things. Yeah, no, you can't exactly do that. Um and, and then she talks about, she says, I've seen pictures of the investigations and the land is completely overgrown and waterlogged. So we're talking about the bog stuff. It would be very easy to hide a body there and never have it resurface. So, you know, one of the great advantages serial killers have is if they live in an area where it's easy to get rid of people. I mean, there's no, there's no question about that. There are other areas where a serial killer might not be, find it so, so he's like, well, how am I going to do this? If it's not conducive to him being able to accomplish the crime. Uh, so you might have less crimes of that sort, or you might have them fewer and far between because he can't accomplish it. But man, when you've got all the, the great lands just to jump, dump people in, it's really useful. You know? <laughs> it's really useful. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, see if there was anything else here. No, I think I did that one already. And that one. Yeah, I think I, um, and one other problem I think that there, there, that, there, that is really a problem 
is that she points out another factor which I've discussed before is the need for earlier, more minor offenses to be caught, reported, and prosecuted sooner. Um, Vincent Connell had attacked so many women by the time Patricia died that he must have thought he'd always get away with it, as indeed he did for the most part. Even if he didn't kill Patricia, I'm not sure which case this is, his record is shocking. As we've seen, many men who kill women have convictions in their past for the sexual assault of women and, and girls, even for murder in some cases. They often got off on some technicality or got the crime downgraded to a lesser charge and so served no time or only a short sentence and were soon free to con 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 uh, continue with their violent behavior. And we do see this. We see, we see guys who are committing sexual assaults being put right back out on the street again or getting a year or getting six months as if it you know, is meaningless or it's a one-off crime and it never is. Sexual assault is never a one-off crime. Uh, so I, I can understand if the if the crime was like something like, oh, he touched my boob type thing, you know. We were drunk, he touched my boob. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say that guy should go to prison for life. But I'm gonna say, if you jump out of the bushes and r rape a woman, um, I'm, go I'm good with life. I'm good with life. I don't, I don't think we need to wait for you to do something worse because who does that? <laughs> who jumps out of bushes and rapes people? It's complete strangers. So I think if that happens, that should be a life sentence, but apparently it isn't. So, I mean, we even have the case of, you know, uh, you know, what do you get? 10, 10, you got 50 years put down to 10 and he's out. And that wasn't, that was an attempted homicide. It was a sexual, uh, it was rape and an, it was clearly going to be an attempted homicide. Uh, uh, it, well, the problem they had at that point was he hadn't tried to kill her yet because he got interrupted. But because he kidnapped her and raped her, I'm good with life. And I don't understand why it's, yeah, it's 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 so easy for these these charges to be downgraded so often. It's it's quite it's quite disgusting. Um, she said here too. Um, uh, she said violence is much more common than she thought when she was a girl. Um, instead of a single serial killer abducting all eight women, uh, that there were actually two more put into this group. It is likely that at least three of them are killed by men they knew, suspects who were nonetheless on who were very much on police radar, but nonetheless were never charged or convicted. So she's finding it's not as simple as she thinks, and I think that's that's very useful. Um, uh, she said, oh, nor do they have any expertise in handling missing persons cases. That's also a problem, a lack of training. Something is still lacking in Ireland and in the U.S. and pretty much every place I know. Uh, there were no databases of crimes, no way to link past incidents. For example, to find a man who tried to abduct a woman before, but she managed to escape, or who had raped and hurt or, hurt or imprisoned someone. This is also true. So you, if, you, if a woman escapes from somebody, who is clearly trying to abduct her, that should go in a database right there. I mean, you, you know, you don't have to wait for somebody to be abducted. He wants, there's a guy who wants to abduct women, period. He tried to do it. It's kind of like, I always thought attempted murder was kind of stupid charge. That just means you suck at murdering. But, oh, you know, you shoot somebody. You shoot somebody five times. You aim at their head. You miss three times and two of the bullets go in the side and the guy doesn't die. He gets attempted murder. What the heck? It shouldn't that be the same because he intended to kill. He tried to kill. He just didn't do a good job of it. So let's say you strangle a woman and she survives. Shouldn't she get life? <laughs> I don't care whether she's, you know, still alive. Shouldn't you get life? I, I don't understand that, you know, downplaying as if this is, well, you know, not as big a deal. Um, so it just says, you know, um, yeah, uh, I'm trying to see if there's anything else left here. Um, I think that, that that's basically it. And uh, yeah, so I suggest getting the book. She's got a lot of interesting things in it, and I think it deserves to be read. So um, um, Harper says, if the crime can be 100% proven, I think criminal psychopaths should be prevented from ever doing again it again. Yes, absolutely. It's, um, yeah. And I, I just, it's funny. We have so many different varieties of charges we put against people and what we you know. It's just craziness sometimes. And then how easy it is to then say, okay. Um, in the case of, um, 
the woman whose name is unsaid, uh, when he went to court for that, uh, he, the reason it went down from 10 from 15 was to keep her from having to go to court and go through the, the horror of being in court, which kind of bothers me because as horrible, whatever happened to her was horrible. So she should have been willing to go to court to prevent, to get to keep him off the street as long as possible. Uh, maybe if, maybe if he could have gotten life, she would have thought it was worth going to court for. I don't know what the situation was, why they went with 10 years instead of 15, just to prevent. Or sometimes I think they're just trying to save money. You know, they're like, hey, you know, it's going to, the court case is going to be long and involved and something might go wrong. And rather than that, we'll just, we'll just give him a plea deal. So instead of giving him a life, we'll give him 20 years. And then he's out in 10. <laughs> you know, it's like, ah, so frustrating. And, and, and then we have so many cases where the guy has been let out and, and, he, and he kills again. Sometimes even the same day he's let out, he's back killing. And then the people go, oh, how shocking, you know, who, who saw that coming? Anyway, all right, so that's my thoughts on this. It's, it's a very difficult thing to try to do, um, but um, if you're still here after all that, uh, please do subscribe to the channel. Um, and next time I'm going to do one case because it's a lot easier to uh, look at one case than a whole pile of cases over many, many years um, that I'm not familiar with. But I did think some of the issues in the case were, very, were, were interesting and worth talking about um, because they made a big deal of the vanishing triangle as being some kind of Bermuda Triangle where the women got sucked in and oh, this one, this serial killer is just running loose. They made it sound that way and it's just not true. So the worst part is it's actually worse than that. There's just many serial killers. Oh, isn't that nice? So <laughs> what is it? What is it? Wait a minute. I'm off packing my au pair bag. Oh, I thought to Tasmania. That, well, that sounds nice. I thought you, I thought I read bag is bog. I'm like, you're au pair bog. <laughs> You're going to go bury somebody in a bog. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, Lisa, that's very nice. That's our home. Yeah. It's a fairly safe home, I think, at least, you know. There's nobody suspicious over here. <laughs> um, won't let me share the link. Oh, yeah, that's, um, if you, if, yeah, if you've ever, if you've got any links, um, if you've got any links, put them in the, yeah, they won't go here, but, uh, you can put them in the chat and you can also put them on uh, I think you can put links on uh, YouTube as well. When, when the show comes out, if there's something pertaining to it. You can, you can put a link in there. Um, so I think you can anyway. Um, I always forget where I always forget where things work and where they don't work after a while. So anyway, thanks for being here. I'll see you all for the, Oh, Oh, um, Wednesday or Thursday probably Wednesday. The the hangout will be at seven o'clock again this week, just because I screwed up my weeks. And um, on alternate Wednesdays, I might have to take care of my granddaughter. And I and so I have to be around on Wednesday during the day. And I screwed that up last week. So I'm going to do another seven o'clock. And then the following week, I'll be back to doing three, three o'clock one week and seven o'clock the other. So this week, sorry, guys who are, who are will be asleep. Um, it'll be seven o'clock. Um, but um, yeah, because I got to take care of my grandkids. So anyway, thank you for being here and I'll see you next time. Bye.